morning, everybody. My name is Tamika Robinson. I want to welcome you to the third annual Bell Path Symposium hosted in conjunction with ATC. We are looking forward to this day. We hope that you enjoy all the presenters and all the topics. And I'm going to turn it over to Miss Suzanne for our icebreaker. Hi, right, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to our symposium. So let's get right to it. I'm going to share my screen with you guys. So let's see. Wait one second. Okay. Okay, now we'd like to get an idea of where everyone is from right now. So we're gonna spin the wheel and we have as many of the countries registered. Forgive us if any of your countries are not here when we put this together at the time with the list. So let's see. We're gonna do a little bit of rapid fire. Do you have anyone in our room from Djibouti? Can anyone help me see if anyone puts up their hands? Do we have anyone in our room from there? No? Not signed in yet? Too early in the morning? Okay, so we're going to go and we're going to spin again. We're going to try and see. Let's see another country. And Morocco. Is Morocco in the house? Do we have anyone from Morocco? I'm from Morocco. Oh, hi. Good morning. Would you good like morning. to share with us? Good afternoon. It's afternoon now. Yeah. Well, it's... good afternoon. Good afternoon. You. So tell us, um, is this your first time at an event like at Belpath or with TESOL with us? I'm in TESOL. I'm a member. Okay. That is excellent. So tell us, who's, do you have a favorite student? Favorite students, you know, yes. <laughs> a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm teaching at the high school and they'll have a lot of students. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, um, okay, about, two, about 240 students. Wow, that yeah. is awesome. And how has it been in the, the, the pandemic in that situation with your students? Yeah, we use it, you know, I, I, personally speaking, I like face to face, but because of pandemic, I use, uh, you know, some uh, platform like uh, virtual classes, sometimes Facebook, sometimes you use, uh, you, uh, you know, uh, Zoom, etc., to contact my well, students. Thank you. thank you very much for sharing with us. You are um, very welcome. Can you, can you just um, pronounce your name for us, please? My name? Yes. La Hussina Hshush. Okay, well, welcome to our Belfast ATC Symposium, and we hope you, you enjoy much. the day. So let's Thank you very go, much. let's take one more spin around the world and see where it takes us. Yeah. Indonesia. It's so exciting, guys. So do we have Indonesia in the house? Do we have anyone from Indonesia? Any hands up from Indonesia yet? No, from time zones being connected. Well, we hope they join. So we're going to go. We're going to go another spin again. Okay, so we'll see again. So let's see. Has anyone joined us uh, since we did our first spin? Any hands up? No? Okay, so we're gonna do one more. Italy, moving over to Europe. Do we have anyone from, from Italy with us this morning? All of these countries were taken from our participants who are registered. So we know that someone from Italy registered with us. So we hope you're in the room. Um, yeah, I think someone's I'm there. Hi, welcome. Can you share your name with us? Do we have anyone from Italy in the room? 
I see we have participants from Tanzania and Iran. <laughs> okay. All right. So one last bit, and then we're going to go to some so you guys can share and get to know each other. We have South Korea. Anyone from South Korea in the room who'd like to share with us? Hi, I just joined the meeting. Sorry, with the question. I'm from South we Korea. Welcome. Please, can you share your name and how long you've been in TESOL with us? Oh, okay. My name is Terry Rowe and well, I arrived in Korea 2011. That's also about the same time I started teaching English here. Wow, thank you. It's been 10 so years, us, yeah. So can you share a little bit about your teaching context? How long have you been teaching? It's been 11 years and I've been a member of TESOL on and off. And I'm actually from the Philippines. Wow. So if that's yes. really, really wonderful. So welcome to our symposium and to all the others. Um, I would just like to say that the, the Black English language professionals and friends or BELPATH and Action TESOL Caribbean are very pleased to welcome you and thank you for spending your Saturday with us. I'm Mary Romney, co-chair of BELPATH along with Tamika Robinson, who you met earlier this morning. As you know, our theme for this year's symposium is creating and sustaining vibrant ELT communities across the globe. So we're especially pleased to see so many colleagues from around the world. We are very grateful to you for your attendance, support, and participation. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of at least one uh, TESOL past president who I've seen in the audience, and that's Dr. Andy Curtis. Um, I, I think um, Dr. Shelley Wong might also be with us and Dr. Deborah Healy, but I'm not sure, uh, but I, I did see them in the registration. So if they are here, thank you very, very much to you and the other board members of TESOL for your, your support and participation. We're very honored by your presence. Um, we're gathered here today in the spirit of sharing our passion for English language education and our interest in social justice, race, diversity, equity, inclusion, and other areas of interest to TESOL professionals. We encourage you to take this symposium as an opportunity to continue networking with colleagues, presenters, and fellow attendees well after the end of today's program. And that's particularly important because we have planned a rather condensed full day program. So now I'd like to introduce you to the co-chair of this symposium, Dr. Renee Figuera, the president of Action TESOL Caribbean, and she will walk you through the program. Thank you very much, Mary. Good, good morning, everyone. Greetings from Trinidad and Tobago. I hope you've received the program, and if not, one of our colleagues will place it in the chat for you to follow. We're looking forward to a shared morning and, and afternoon sessions, which will be organized thematically. I'm your timekeeper actually for most of the day. And uh, this will entail the use of a very non-intrusive bell five minutes before the presenter's time is up in the academic sessions. At 8.30, we will begin looking at, and that's just a minute away, so I better hurry up. <laughs> We're looking at localization strategies for professional development and teaching, and this will be followed by our plenary at 9.30. And subsequently, we will have two more morning sessions at 10 and at 11. And the first is about internalized ideologies and linguistic abilities, and the second focuses on pandemic pedagogies. And these will be followed by a 10 minute Q&A. So please place your questions in the chat at any time, or you may ask your questions openly at the end of both presentations. Of course, at midday, we have an EFL colloquium with Black English language professionals who are teaching in various locations around the world. And of course, this is also going to be followed by a 10 minute Q&A. After this, we have the US Department of State and the Fulbright Commission talking about opportunities for EFL professionals. At lunchtime, 
um, which is about 1.30, the members of Belpath will be introducing their 2021-2022 TESOLA of the Year Award. So this is exciting. And of course, we have more sessions after this, which will deal with global, citizen sorry, global citizenship and pedagogies in the community. And at two and three respectively, uh, these sessions will take place. And uh, later on, our closing plenary is at four, and we'll be followed by some audiovisual presentations by students. So we're looking to wrap our day up around five. So Mary, back to you. Thank you. So I'm privileged to introduce the first two presenters, Colleen Hector and Mazin Sali, whose presentations are based on the theme of localization strategies for professional development and teaching. So Colleen. Thank you, Mary. I'm just going to share my screen. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are in the world. My name is Colleen Hector. I am a free, free practice teacher and a former student of the University of the West Indies in Trinidad and Tobago, as well as a member of Action People Caribbean. Today, I'll be presenting for you Shakespeare and the Modern Student, Finding Intrinsic Motivation. So over the years, teachers have struggled to find ways to maintain and sustain students' interest in Shakespeare. However, the modern student is often at odds, especially the modern student of color, is often at odds with Shakespeare because they don't understand or they are unaware of the value Shakespeare can have to their life and has in many different fields and the importance of studying Shakespeare. Therefore, it was concluded. <laughs> Give me a minute, please. Thus, this presentation is going to help teachers in cultivating this intrinsic motivation in students to study Shakespeare by bringing awareness of how Shakespeare can give them many opportunities and how it is relevant to their life. Reason students of color do not find Shakespeare relevant. The first one is because Shakespeare is not intrinsically part of their culture. Most students of color and those in the Caribbean see Shakespeare as something foreign and part of white culture. So they aren't really sure how it fits with them. They see no particular use to their daily lives or future, and they lack the knowledge of the opportunities and influences of Shakespeare. The reasoning for this study, um, for this presentation was taken from Desi and Ryan, 2017 and 1985. Uh, both works speaks on the idea of finding meaning in work. Um, and once that meaning is found, it creates motivation, commitment, and is better for the overall well being of the person. Their second work speaks of the basic psychological needs of a student that needs to be met that is, competence, autonomy, and relatedness. For the purpose of this presentation, we will focus on meaningfulness, relatedness, and autonomy. Um, that is because it was surmised that the students of color who are studying Shakespeare lack these three physical, these three psychological needs, or these three psychological needs aren't being met. Further, so. So in order to meet these needs, teachers 
must make Shakespeare relevant to the students. And to do this, they first must have an idea of what students value, what, what are their goals and their aspirations. Once they have discovered this, they can create a relationship or link between Shakespeare and what the student values. Once relatedness has been formed, meaning automatically comes because now the material has a personal impact on them. And once meaning is developed, autonomy naturally flows because they are no longer passively forced to study this subject because it is a requirement. Now they are actively studying it because it is something that has importance to them. Uh, this idea was also solidified through the exploration of the works by Spencer in 1999, Social and Cultural Influences on School um, Adjustments and Os Osman et al., a socially contextual contextualized model of African-American identity. In these two works, it was found that students whose racial identities are embraced show higher levels of motivation, of academic motivation. Therefore, it was concluded that students whose individual identities, individual identities in the context of this presentation comprises of their ethnic and racial identity, as well as their personal interests and aspirations. So it is logical to think if their individual identities are embraced, it would also, they too would also show higher levels of intrinsic academic motivation. So at this point, um, I'm going to show you some examples of persons and what they did and how they created intrinsic motivation in their students. After which I would like to elicit some examples of how you have um, have, elicited, have have cultivated or developed intrinsic motivation in your own students, and then I'll give you some ideas for those of you who you know just need a little help. So the first example comes from Akala. Um, he is the founder of the Hip Hop Shakespeare Company. I am not sure how many of you have heard of him, but Akala explores with students, with black students, the similarities between the rhythm and rhyme of Shakespeare and hip hop, as well as the use of the language, the Shakespearean language and the language that, are, that is used in rap music. Uh, one of the activities that he does with his students is that he raps lines from Shakespeare and from hip hop um, songs as well, and has the students guess which is which. Um, two out of three times while he is doing this activity, the, the persons guess incorrectly, mistaking raps for Shakespeare and vice versa. So I will just do a small activity with you as well. Um, these are some lines taken from both Shakespeare and hip hop songs. And I'll just read them and I'll give you like 30 seconds to guess which is which, and then I'll give you the answer. I will not be rapping because I am not a rapper. So, first line To destroy the beauty from which one came. Can anybody guess Shakespeare or rap? I'm thinking Shakespeare. No, this is actually rap and it's a song. It is a track by Jay-Z, Can I Live? So, the second one is maybe it's hatred I spew, maybe it's food for the spirit. Anyone? Okay, so for those of you who guessed rap, 
Yes, you were correct. This is by Eminem from the track called Renegade. The third one, men would rather use their broken weapons than their bare hands. For those of you saying Shakespeare, yes, you were correct. This is Shakespeare from the play Othello. And the final one, the most benevolent king communicates through your dreams. Would anyone like to guess? You can say, you can open your mic quickly and say. I'm guessing no. Shakespeare. Shakespeare? No. Yeah. This is from a song by the Wu Tang Clan. Yeah, so this is what um, Akala does. He shows the students that the language between Shakespeare, the Shakespearean language, and rap language isn't so different, and that they do put, possess the competence to understand and analyze Shakespeare. Because if they can understand and analyze the songs that Jay Z and Eminem are singing and find the hidden messages that they have in it and who they are speaking about. They can do the same with, with Shakespeare. That is why I didn't touch on the meeting the basic needs of competence because the students already have it. They just need to need some direction in utilizing it. Um, in the Caribbean here, we also make Shakespeare relevant because perhaps more than the American culture to us, Caribbean person, Shakespeare is the most foreign because you know it's very European themes and characters. And one of the persons who makes Shakespeare relevant is Deborah Jean Baptiste Samuel. She is a Trinidadian, a performer, storyteller, and the founder and leader of the Oratory Foundation. She uses Shakespeare to help students become fluent in oral expression, dramatic monologue, poetry and performance, public speaking, and much more. And how she does this, how she creates this relevance between Shakespeare and the Caribbean or Caribbean tradition, Caribbean literature, is that she cannibalizes Shakespeare. That is, she adds very Caribbean elements to Shakespeare's plays, not only to make it relatable, but to also show that Shakespeare isn't as foreign as we may think, and that the Shakespearean language is very similar to Caribbean folk talk. Um, an example of this I'll give you is by is the Midnight Robber. He's uh, one of our traditional characters that we use in oral tradition. And this is just a little excerpt that I took from one of his um, from a Midnight Rubber performance. Ah, <clears throat> I'd have squeezed the, the juice from the hangman noose and eat the dictator liver for my supper. I'd have bathed in acid and scrub my teeth in the ashes of harony and grease my foot beyond petroleum jelly. There's no pain that I have not caused. Here, the rubber is simply making reference to the leadership of Trinidad Tobago as well as the process of uh, harvesting sugar canes that we make in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, the line, there is no pain that I have not caused. The rubber is known to be boastful and boasting about many villainous deeds. So he takes credit for many of the things that happen in the world. He's a very interesting character and I will put some links in the chat for those of you who are interested in learning more. But the fact of the matter is that the same sort of boastful articulation and the witty rhyme and metaphor that the Midnight Rubber uses, Shakespeare also uses in his language and has his characters embodied. Um, some similar characters are Prospero, um, Iago. Iago had that boastful nature that the Midnight Rubber embodies. Um, Puck and uh, Fest also has um, the kind of playful, omniscient personality that the Midnight Rubber also has. Um, all of this is to say that we are not as removed, or the student of color, the black student is not as removed 
from Shakespeare as they may believe, and is much more relevant and much more relatable than they, than they think. Uh, before I move on, um, I'll just take about three minutes to ask you to give me some examples that you have used in the past or are currently using to create you know, this, this intrinsic motivation in your students to make the work more relatable to them. Anyone? Oh, there it is. I was just going to say, Colleen, I think we see a question. So in the interest of time, maybe um, you can address the question from Kasundio about the level of the students and access to Shakespearean language before continuing. Okay, yes, I'm seeing the question. Uh, the level of the students are high school or secondary level students so they can range from the ages of 13 to 17 and yes they can get access to Shakespearean language there are many um copies of of Shakespeare's plays available um in bookstores as well as on the internet many of them as you can easily download um pdfs of it Um, if there are no other questions and no examples, I'll continue. Ms. Hector? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. So if I would like, I would just like to um, add as well, we have drama. We can do drama because even um, I'm a primary school teacher. And um, it, in order to get students interested in um, any kind of literature or whatever not, it's, it helps to have them involved. So to really get them to relate to it and even the language, because when we look at even something like our um, King James version of the Bible, we have the language being very similar to mm -hmm. what you would find in Shakespeare and having the children dramatize does help them to identify and become a little more um, comfortable when they begin to read it and explore. Yes, that is very true. Thank you for your contribution. Um, these are just a few other industries that you can look into when you're trying to make that connection between the student's interest and Shakespeare, and it is the movie industry. Uh, through the growth of technology, social media influencers, you know, persons of color are no longer beholden to the gatekeeping of Hollywood. Now we can produce, star, edit, direct our own movies, our own shorts, our own TV series, and put it out there and get it recognized, right? And oftentimes these students, they take inspiration and direction from their favorite directors and producers and movies. And it's good to show them that their favorites also took direction from others, one of them being Shakespeare, you know? And some of the most successful movies to this date and most iconic and classic movies are those that were influenced by Shakespeare. So one of them is Disney's 1994 animated movie, The Lion King, which we all know was made into a 2019 live action, and it was based off of Hamlet. Some of the similarities uh, in this movie is, of course, of course, the main characters are both princes. There's Simba, who is equated to Hamlet. Both their fathers die. There was King Mustafa, King Hamlet. Both had evil uncles, Ka, Claudius. Um, both were sent into exile, and both their fathers reappear as ghosts or apparitions to them in the future. Another movie, um, one of my favorites, is the 1999. American romantic comedy, 10 Things I Hate About You. It is a modern adaptation of The Taming of the Shrew, um, and it does use characters of the same name. Uh, they are the sisters, Kat, 
who of course is Catherine and B who is Bianca. And just to show like, you know, the similarities in how the director built his character and the characters in Shakespeare, I give a little description of Catherine. This is how um, Horentio describes Catherine. Is that she is intolerable curse, assured and forward, so beyond all measure. And this is the more modern description of Catherine in Tempting Me. It is a hideous bitch and scary. And this is how most of her classmates, even some of the teachers, described her. Um, so these are just some examples that you can use, and there are a whole lot of them out there as well. Um, Shakespeare also has had um, influence on other industries that in my time wasn't as mainstream as it, as it is now. Um, it has become extremely visible in media and has been a lot of success. And that is the comic industry, the anime and manga industry as well. I'm not sure how many of you know of it or, or watch it, but it is very popular with um, younger persons. Um, especially Black and Asian students. So one of the comics that you can use as an example is um, Sandman by Neil Gaiman. He is a world-renowned comic, story writer, producer, right? And his comic was printed in 19... 89 and went until 1966 and up to this day it is still being reprinted it has a it was turned into an audio book in 2020 and it has it is slated to be made into a tv series in 2022 so this is how um how successful his work has been and Gimon has often taken his inspiration from shakespeare he even uses shakespeare's characters and shakespeare himself is a character in the comic um, he takes his influence from A, Mid a Midsummer's Night Dream, The Tempest, The Merchants of Venice, and many, many others. And to a point, Gimon's success can be accredited to his understanding of Shakespeare and his masterful application of that understanding. And this is something you want to impart on your students to let them know that if they develop this understanding as well, they too can use that understanding to create something greater and bigger and extremely successful. Um, another person who also uses their understanding of Shakespeare to create works of art that span beyond, beyond Shakespeare is Kyo Shirodaira. He is an award-winning Japanese author and scriptwriter, and he created The Blast of the Tempest, which was originally a manga that was released in 2019, 2009, sorry, to 2013, and was made into an anime in 2012. He also takes uh, influence from Shakespeare's plays such as Hamlet and The Tempest, and expresses themes and he expresses the themes of these plays through the background that he gives his, his characters. Like one of his characters, the female lead, she was supposed to be the head of her clan, but her birthright was stolen. And then she was exiled to a deserted island to die. You know, and her, her, her backstory follows the, the plot of the Tempest. But not only did uh, Shiodaira take influence from Shakespeare. He also was able to adapt it for a Japanese audience. And that was because of his understanding. And this is, it is crucial that he impart that it was because of their understanding, because of their, their understanding of Shakespeare that they were able to create these works. Also, that Shakespeare, before I move on, just one other point that Shakespeare spans throughout generations. Its influence doesn't fade, isn't stuck in one era. If you saw from the examples that I took, it was 
from different points in time, from 1999, 2009, 2020. So, you know, it will always be relevant and it is timeless. So in conclusion, to develop intrinsic motivation in students of color, their psychological needs of meaningfulness, autonomy, and relatedness must be met. In order to do this, in order to do this, as well as sorry, as well as the individual identity. And in order for teachers to do this, they must, you know, develop an understanding of what their students value or who their students are and create links in what they value and Shakespeare. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you enjoy the rest of the symposium. If you have um, any more questions, feel free to message me after. We actually have um, a couple of minutes for, for questions uh, if anybody would like to ask them. That was a fascinating presentation, Colleen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. We do have a um, we do have a just a few minutes, maybe um, three minutes or so for live questions. I mean, if anybody in the audience would like to ask Colleen a question or make a comment, I do have a comment if if that's okay. Absolutely. So Colleen, I'd just like to say thanks so much for sharing what you have. When I was a high school student, I did not like literature class. I loved reading. I just didn't like lit class because I was forced to read and therefore I did not want to read any of the books. However, I love movies. I love TV shows. And my husband was a lit major in college. And he is the one that's explaining these things to me and showing exactly what you just talked about, which is how so much of the classical literature influences what I'm watching. And he he dismantles things that, with such ease and grace. And it's really wonderful to see a teacher who is actively making that connection with young people and showing like, hey, you're interested in this, but hey, did you know it really came from this? So I just wanted to yes. jump in to say, I, I love it. I love it. And if I may say something also, it explains a lot. The fact that um, she touched on the movie industry, they are able to capitalize on what we have not seen. And now we understand why children gravitate towards cartoons. The storyline is a bit different. Um, it's the same, but with difference in characters. And th the way the concepts are brought across are also the same. Sorry, are also different. But, uh, you know, the, the whole movie appeal brings it across differently. We were looking at just words in high school in literature. So we didn't even understand that English language could have images. And I think for me, that's why I did not like literature. So I have gravitated more towards English language. I, 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 I loved um, reading magazines and comics, but I would not pick up a literature book for the life of me like I didn't want to see anything but when I'm now at this stage now that I'm able to interpret and understand differently I found this presentation to be one of the most amazing breakdown of literature and why students in the Caribbean struggle so much because even if you I'm from Jamaica so we, we probably have heard of Vibes Cartel he is one of the most vibrant minds in literature in Jamaica and he was able to break down um, the English language in such a way that he converted it to Patois and used the same approach in the concept to win all the students in the Caribbean. And, he, and you know, it's that level of, of understanding that we want the children to have in breaking down the English language. So I do really appreciate this presentation this morning. You won't even understand how excited I am about <laughs> this. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> and you know, even at this moment, there is a movement to to recognize fan fiction as literature yes. and as academic literature because students, you know, they see movies and then they have a whole idea in their head of how this movie should go or how it can develop. And they create these wonderful, diverse worlds in these fictions, you know, and it's worth recognition. Beautiful. <laughs> I think I saw a hand raised. Sure. Yes. Um, Sherilyn. 
Oh, I can go ahead? All right, fantastic. I'm a teacher as well, and I use literature, I use storytelling in my classes so that the students are, because we have this, you'll hear later on, but we have this situation in our language classes here. And what I do is I use literature, I use stories, I use films that allow them to speak their ideas out because they struggle so much with English that you want them to be able to express the excitement of literature. And then when they talk, then we use that now as a basis to teach summary. We use it to teach persuasion. We use it to teach the other things that are of interest to them. So your presentation is extremely exciting for me. And some of your ideas, I'm going to borrow them, OK? <laughs> just, <laughs> just going to borrow them for a little while. <laughs> Well, Colleen, it certainly looks like you've inspired a lot of people. So thank you so much. This has just been amazing. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I am Keisha Bryan, and I have the privilege of introducing our morning plenary. Dr. Okan Effiong is an English lecturer and the chair of the conference committee in the foundation program department of English at Qatar University. Before teaching in Qatar, Okan taught in Nigeria, the United Kingdom, and Japan. He is also an experienced special needs teacher of young adults with autism, autistic spectrum disorders. Okan Effiong is a current member of the TESOL International Association Board of Directors. He has served TESOL as chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, chair elect of the um, EFL interest section, the newsletter editor of the EFL intersection. He is also the founder of Africa English Language Teaching Association, formerly Africa TESOL, and he's also its past president. He was the president of Qatar TESOL from 2014 to 2015. Okan holds a PhD in Applied Linguistics from the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom, and his interests include Foreign Language Anxiety and Language Teacher Association. So I welcome and present to you our fabulous dynamic speaker for the morning, Dr. Okan Effiong. Thank you, Keisha. You're welcome. Uh, I'd like to share my screen. Sure. Can you see my screen? No, not yet. Not yet? No, not yet. Um, it's showing on my laptop here. Okay. So Did you hit the share screen me. button at the bottom? Yep. Yes. Yep. So uh, let me do that again. Okay. Share screen. Um, okay. How about that? Yes. Okay. Let me go into F5 mode. Okay. Good to go. Yes. Thank you very much. And good afternoon from Abuja, Nigeria. I teach in Qatar University, but um, I'm currently holidaying in Nigeria in what I would like to call an immersion program. The pandemic has really created situations where we have two different worlds, the haves and the haves not. So what I decided to do was to come and experience firsthand the struggles of teachers in Africa. And I'll be drawing on examples from Nigeria and compare with what obtains in Qatar. I chose this title, Soldiering On Regardless. Soldiering in the sense that we keep struggling, we keep doing what we are supposed to do, regardless of the impediments, the handicaps, and the situation the pandemic has put everybody globally. So that's the topic. And this is just a simple message. So I'm just wondering, is this where we're going to be? Is learning going to be virtual or are we going to go back to face-to-face? -to -face? I'm referring to the global situation because while a lot of people are attending classes online, in some parts of the world, there's nothing going on. They're completely shut down. It is just recent that some, some countries are opening schools for students to attend. And I've just experienced that in Nigeria here. So I can't really say for sure whether this is where we're meant to be or if this is where we are going to be. 
So for now, everybody says, I'm not sure of the future. What happens next week, next year, next five years? Nobody's sure. So we just go with the flow. We've been afraid of the virus, of the computer virus in the past. Computer virus using antivirus software to fight virus. But nobody talks about computer virus anymore because we live with computers. The fear is coronavirus. Why people are afraid of coronavirus in different parts of the world, where I come from, Nigeria, nobody's afraid of coronavirus. In our breakout room, we discuss this. People worry about hunger virus, not coronavirus. So if you talk to students or to parents, they will tell you there's no corona in Nigeria. If you wear a mask in public place, you look very odd because they just feel there's more to worry about than coronavirus. And still some people don't believe the virus exists. They think it's just something the Western world is using to maybe confuse the developing world or to try to bring some medication that will maybe control our population, which is very, very wrong. So um, some of my slides, I must be honest with you because um, I had to fly into Abuja from my village because the connectivity issues that we have in some parts of the country is so severe that you cannot sustain an online discussion for more than 10 minutes without being kicked out or being reconnected. So, but luckily I've been here for like 17 minutes, still connected, no issues. And I'm hoping that um, we won't have issues until I finish my session. So I also wanted to prove to the world that, well, this is just how it is. We can't pretend. So if I get kicked out, I'll try to come back in. So fingers crossed. And <clears throat> when the music changes, the dance will also change. So we're talking virtual. Curricula were designed for face-to-face -face teaching. When the pandemic started, nobody thought about redesigning the curriculum to fit the new setting to fit online teaching. We all had to teach virtually with curricula that were designed for face-to-face -face teaching. So that's why I just put this up here for people to see. I remember when I was in my primary school in the 1960s, we were using easel. What you see on the left there, easel. Teacher would stand there and write on that and clean. We still have this in different parts of the world and especially in my country and my village, people are still using ESO to teach. So when we talk about computers, virtual learning, this is still, this is French to them because some kids have never seen a laptop before. So how do they learn virtually when they don't even know what a computer is? That is just something we're gonna talk about later. The problems, the issues um, they have to deal with if you have to learn virtually. And for many of you, this is what you are used to. All these uh, platforms that people used to teach, you know, you see this in the developed parts of the world. Qatar in particular is a rich country and the school setting there is great. They have the facilities. So things are going smoothly. Learning is going on all right. Then sometimes I sit back and ask myself, if we in the developed parts of the world are complaining of things. What about other parts of the world where they don't even have these things? What do you expect them to complain of? In Nigerian language, we use the word, your life is complete. When we say your life is complete, it means you have nothing to worry about. So when I tell people, this is how we teach in Qatar, and they look at me in amazement. Wow, they feel your life is complete. But then, those of us in Qatar, we still complain about problems with online teaching. Some people don't even see the facilities to do the online teaching. So it's very difficult to really have a global perspective or to have a uniform answer to the problem that the pandemic has created for, the, every, for all the teachers. So here we go. If we look at the high tech regions, the low tech regions, some countries are in the middle, maybe the developing countries, the underdeveloped are the low tech are referred to. 
Whereas you have a choice of a Microsoft Teams or Webex or Zoom or Blackboard Ultra to choose from. Like in Qatar University, we can choose with Blackboard Collaborative Ultra, or you can use Teams if the system is down, or you can switch to another platform. In some places, they don't even have one. There's nothing to switch to. So they rely on maybe Facebook. And um, before this, in a breakout room, we heard about people using Facebook to communicate with students. WhatsApp is something that a lot of people are using in Africa. I used to complain when I don't see people show up for our sessions. I used to complain that what's going on with teachers in Africa? Why don't they attend our sessions? Why don't they come to webinars? It is only when I came to Nigeria in May that I realized the challenges that teachers do have here in terms of linking to sessions like this. Because it costs so much money to get one gigabyte to be able to stay connected for 15 minutes or one hour online session using Zoom or any of the big platforms that you know has been, has been the tool that the teachers in Africa are using to communicate. And for that reason, Africa Elta is starting a symposium next month and is going to be hosted on WhatsApp. It's going to be hosted on WhatsApp. So, Sam, okay. And during the pandemic, some learning was still going on with teachers teaching using television in Nigeria in particular. There's, there was very, very little interaction between the teacher and students because they just watch television like they watch a news program or maybe any drama program. Then the question was, how many people actually can afford television sets? The next one is, how many have the money to put petrol in the generator to run the television set? So these were the challenges they were having. Then talking about radio, how many can afford the batteries to put in the radio to listen to lessons? So it boils down to so many students not attending classes at all because nothing was available. Schools were shut down and it is recently that schools have opened. And then I visited my, primary, my village secondary school. I walked into the junior secondary school classroom. We should sit 30 students, but I found 150 students in class. Then the question was, how do you manage this as a teacher? 150 students in a class that should sit 30 students? People talk about social distancing, that doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Technology doesn't exist. So that's just the picture that I'm trying to paint here. Back to where things are happening, where things are working. Where you have technology, you have books, you have materials you can access. When the pandemic started, we switched, we switched swiftly to online teaching. Textbooks were made available to students virtually, so e-copies, and then we carried on. Then talking about incentives to continue doing what you're doing, salary remained. There were cuts in some of the things that the university made available to teachers. For example, the transport allowance was cut because we're not driving to school. Conference attendance was cut, uh, conference grants was cut because nobody was attending conference anymore. And then there was restructuring based on the national economy where things had to be downsized by 30%. That affected the health insurance, the money the university was paying to, towards um, students at school fees or children of staff. And then the good thing is the community of practice, the COPs, were galvanized. They kicked into action. And this way, they became like the savior. Because in the past, so many could not attend conferences in outside their countries or outside their continents. But with virtual webinars and seminars and everything going on, many teachers in the world were able to access many of these 
professional development um, activities. And then the network that this opportunity created broadened the horizon of so many teachers, especially those who were not able to attend physical conferences. So in terms of support, Qatar, for example, was able to update our devices. If the computer didn't have the audio or whatever problem it had, you were given a new computer. And then we also had to learn new things as teachers. We had to learn. People that were not so savvy with technology were forced to. The support structure was also very strong in the university. The ITS department was enriched and then well-staffed and they were working round the clock. There were training sessions going on. You know, every day there was something for people to learn, to be able to use the tools. And luckily for people who are over 60, there were, there were some exemptions. And then everything was tied to government guidelines as well. The university had to now align its activities based on the guidelines the government was giving because things were changing every day, depending on the number of cases that were reported. But the benefit was every teacher now learned new skill. And sometimes we'll joke, joke about um, being able to work, we will leave the classroom as English teachers, that we could work as IT support staff because we've all learned new things. So as you can see, we're looking at um, teaching global, globally. On the left is a picture of Doha, a picture of uh, Northern Nigeria. The question I'm gonna ask you, when we talk about pandemic, virtual learning, how will you expect the people, the pupils on the right-hand side to learn in this current um, situation? That's the question I'm gonna ask you. So when we talk about the problems and issues arising from the pandemic, it will not even apply to these people. And at the best of times, we had problems dealing with students, dealing with students' issues, dealing with parents. At the best of times, we had support structure that was not absolutely perfect, that had defects. At the best of times, we had cultural blocks. For example, in Nigeria, not every parent will subscribe to the child using a smartphone to join a lecture or join classes. One, smartphone is seen as a tool for corruption. Smartphone is seen as a tool for sin because they believe when you get on the social media, you're going to meet people, bad people. You're going to meet pedophiles. You're going to be corrupt. You're going to have boyfriend and girlfriend. So they will not support the idea of buying smartphones for the children. Even where you have the smartphone, what about the data package? When it costs about $3 to buy one gigabyte of data, $3. And the average teacher's salary here is about maybe $40, primary school, secondary school, maybe $70 a month. Who is going to give you $3 to go and buy data? When the whole salary is $70, you have bills to pay, you have to buy food, you have to pay school fees and other things. It really brought to surface the great divide between the rich and the poor. Because those who could afford private schools that had all these uh, facilities, the children were going to school. They were doing online learning. Right now, I'm sitting in my younger brother's house in his bedroom, in his room, so his children can afford to do online learning easily. Then I worry about the people in the village that cannot afford to pay the school fees that these private schools charge. So it was a big disadvantage for those who could not afford it. So while so many people were at home for like a year without attending schools, some children were still going to school because the parents could afford it. That is the problem we are having here. And so when we talk about today's language classroom, who is it for? Is it for everybody? Or is it for the rich? And what is it about? How are we going to continue teaching English with this current situation where 
some people can afford what is required to be able to learn effectively, whereas so many cannot. What happens in the virtual classroom is also another question. Even where it is functioning, how do you as a teacher control your classroom? In our breakout room, we talked about this. Um, there's a lady from Tanzania that also mentioned the problems and I was telling her it's not only Tanzania, it's global, global in the sense that in different parts of the world, maybe some poor parts of um, Americas or some poor parts of Asia or uh, Middle East or Africa, things are really not happening. Things are not happening. So if we are talking about the virtual classroom, it cannot be a perfect one. It cannot be a perfect one in the sense that we lack the control over our students. We don't even know who we are teaching. You stay in front of your laptop with your video showing, your students don't have their video switched on and they have their audio on or off. And when you try to engage them, you don't hear any response. And then they'll blame technology for that. You know? They'll blame technology and say, that, oh, teacher, my, this thing is switched off. Oh, teacher, this is happening. And because they have their own network, when you call on a student, says, Joy, please, can you answer the question? No answer. What happens? People will now share messages. If maybe Joy will now come on and give excuses. What I do with my students is I just have a piece of paper and their names on paper. And I tell them online participation draws a 5%. So if I don't hear you in class, you don't get the marks. So when I ask a question, call on Joy. Joy, can you answer? No answer. So Joy is absent today. Then somebody who answers, I'll just make a dot. And at the end of the class, maybe you have like three dots. It means you've spoken three times in class. So that's the only way to keep them tuned to the, to the class, to the lesson. So then teachers too, we also have this tech overload too many training sessions, too much technology, and it's like sensory overload. For that reason, I've been here like 10 weeks in Nigeria. This is the third time I've sat on the computer because I said no television, no computer, no social media, nothing. The previous two occasions were when I had meetings, the very important meetings I couldn't avoid because I just wanted to clear my brain, clear my mind of technology. When I go back, uh, maybe in two weeks time, I'm back again, I'll be living in the computer and on the computer. But the good news is we teachers, we are there for each other, supporting each other. Especially in my program in Qatar, we have a WhatsApp group. So many problems that teachers have, they just post it on the group and then somebody will respond immediately. Instead of sending emails to ITS and then waiting for response or waiting for ticket number and queuing for me to be attended to, somebody will just respond. That is very, very supportive. And I found that the, like the best support group. And I actually added them to my definition of COP. So how do we get the learners to buy into this? And um, this is just an example of what happens. When you think your students are in class, no. Sometimes you hear a student talking in the background with people eating food, eating lunch, and he says, sorry, teacher, I'm having lunch. I can't answer your question. I'm asked, how can you be having lunch during class time? It's family time. This is when we eat lunch in the family. So what do you do? They may be on the beach enjoying their picnic or sleeping. They log in. And at the end of the class, I look at the screen and I see about one quarter of the class are still locked in. Class has ended, which means this student did not even attend the class. They simply locked in. And then that was it. So they were not even aware of when the class finished. Look at the picture at the bottom left. Back in the days, that's how it was. But nowadays, it's just easy. Click your audio button, click your video button, and that's it. You're done. So cheating is another thing. How do you control teaching? How do you know the person who is in front of you responding with audio only, without video, is the student you are teaching? So many things they're having to deal with as teachers in the, the new dispensation. So these are all questions and questions without answers. So the question is, are students happy to come back to face-to-face -to -face teaching or are they just happy to remain virtual because it gives them the leeway to cheat? Are teachers happy to come back to face-to-face -to -face teaching 
because there are some benefits too to this online teaching, you know? For example, um, I didn't really know how much I spent on food until the pandemic. I never went anywhere. All I did was shopping twice in a month. At the end of the month, you see your credit card bill and then you say, oh, so this is how much you spend on food. So the driving around and the usual social things and bars and clubs and were cut out. So you end up with more money in your pocket. So my message now is for the community of practice that have been really, they've come up and come to the rescue. That's the word for it, come to the rescue. Because the COPs are for teachers, by teachers, helping to mentor teachers and also creating leadership pathways. Because between then and now, in the past 12 months, we've had new leaders emerging from different COPs as a result of the pandemic. People who were not really, really interested or showing so much interest are now able to, you know, step in and be able to do what they wouldn't have done if not for the pandemic. So it's not all doom and gloom. The big boys, the TESOL International Association, IATFO, they've been there doing everything they could. And then the emerging ones, the younger ones like Africa Alta, the new ones like TESOL Gulf, and then we have the national associations doing things. And then we have them um, groups within the colleges doing things. So we're all there helping each other. And my time is coming, I know, I have a few minutes left. So I was talking about the not all doom and gloom. We are saving money in so many ways because um, we're no longer doing this again before going out. So we're spending very less. I mean, I remember looking at my, my cabinet, the perfume I bought in 2019, sat there for like 15 months and it was still there because I wasn't going anywhere. And I wouldn't wear perfume to a class and sit in front of a computer. You know, you didn't have to do your manicure, pedicure because you could just wake up from your bed, wash your face and come to class. And that was it. So in a way, it kind of saved um, a few pennies you could use to do other things. So when people complain about the pandemic, pandemic, check your bank balance. It's probably healthier than the face-to-face -face era. So my final word is, um, we are humans. We have to keep doing what we are doing. We as teachers, we have the capacity, the willingness, the ability to keep doing what we are doing. So we shouldn't let anything stop us. Sometimes we may forget to do what we should do. And it's also important for us to reflect and fix whatever it is that we missed in the course of our teaching. And we still don't know where we are going from here. So um, I don't know if you can hear this young man here. I've used this before. So let's see if you can hear, that would be great. This is a young boy that was having a party, fell down, cried, and even in that process, he got up and continued dancing with tears in his eyes. And then again, the party continued. This is what I want teachers to do, regardless of what happens. I don't know if you can hear. There you go. So I think I can take a few questions. Thank you very much. Yes, we do have time for some questions. Um, so if you would, uh, please start putting your questions in the chat. We have heard from Okan, thank you so much for this absolutely wonderful talk um, in the short amount of time. We all have had to reset during the pandemic and your context, depending on your context, that reset looked totally different, right? There were pandemics of poverty before COVID-19 as Dr. F. Young pointed out. And so again, depending on your context, you know, how do we prioritize? Do we prioritize COVID-19 prep or the pandemics before COVID-19? You know, in the United States, we had a race pandemic before COVID-19 and COVID-19 actually exacerbated that. So what's important to target in the particular context? COVID, um, Dr. Effiong's uh, talk kind of touched on that. And then the illusion of the perfect classroom, right? We have this illusion, what's perfect? 
right? Is, is there such thing as perfection, right? We're teachers, we make do. Um, and we know the issues will arise. So thank you also for pointing that out because sometimes we have to remember, we have to continue to reiterate that issues will arise. We're not perfect. There will be glitches, right? There will be tech overload and we have to figure out how to get our learners to buy in, okay? And we have to contend with them doing other things at home while they're learning, right? And so I think the, 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 the title of your talk was so powerful, soldiering on regardless. And as teachers, that is what we do. We soldier on regardless. So thank you so much for a wonderful talk. And we will open it up because we have some time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ethion. My pleasure. Hi, good morning. Um, Dr. Ethion, that was a really, really powerful presentation. Um, I can relate to so many of the points that you made about the inequities and the two education systems that are available and that we have to navigate. When you have two different worlds living in one space, you have to really pull out all the, all of your tools from your little bag, you know, and in Jamaica, we say you have to turn your hand make fashion, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to get creative. Um, I had, I have some experience with high school and I actually did something and presented to them. I'm not sure how many of them are actually using it, but I gave them the idea anyway. Um, of using project-based learning instead of the traditional um, methodologies that we would normally use. Because what we're trying to do is that the pandemic has really given us, uh, a, a, a blindsided us, so to speak. So our response with the technology is really to try to take the same square peg to fit in a round hole. And it's not working. The things that you would normally do um, the methods that you would normally present, how you would teach, all of that has to change. So what I came up with was like a modified PBL and you create instead for the students work kits or projects and you send it to them into their villages, into their communities and let them do projects that are based upon what you want them to learn from the curriculum. So one project will include math, science, language, social studies, all of these content, the content-based stuff is placed inside of the project. And not just that, because a lot of my students come from low-income communities, these economically sustainable projects give them money. So they're starting like a chicken farm or a vegetable garden or beautification projects, and they're writing letters, they're talking to their counselors, their politicians in their communities, they're utilizing all of the language um, skills, the communicative skills that I want them to learn. They are actually doing it in practice through projects. So you don't have this heavy reliance on the technology because them just not have it, right? Them not have no cell phone, the data not there, internet connections bad. If we use other means of teaching, we can eliminate some of the the disparities that we have in our system. That's a suggestion I made um, earlier this year, late last year, when I was really looking at the impact on COVID, of COVID on our system. And it really helped. Well, it helped me in teaching my students. So I'm just throwing that out there. Thank you, Shayla. Good stuff. Any more contributions or questions? I just wanted to say thank you so much for an inspirational talk. Um, it just got me really thinking about how resourceful Africa is and, and the resources that they even take from Africa to make these computers and not to have these computers and have this technology available to all parts of Africa. It's just really disheartening. And I'm just wondering, how we in the diaspora can to help alleviate some of these systemic problems because they seem more systemic as well in terms of the impacts of colonialism and from um, imperialism and um, from all of the different things that have happened in the past that are continuing to happen now with 
the government and so forth for this to happen. And I was just wondering what, what can be done, not only Band-Aid solutions, but some actual structural and institutional um, things that can happen in order to make sure that everyone gets what they need. Um, if I may come in there, Africa in particular can benefit from some, some sort of laptop. I think there was something like a $100 laptop that uh, Microsoft created for schools. Something like that. It doesn't have to be all singing and dancing with all the big, big stuff. If that is possible, it could go a long way to helping a particular community. The other thing is um, the disused laptops. Like um, I know my university, for example, after three years, they have to ship them to. I don't know where they ship them to, but they get rid of them. So if those things can be channeled, transported to certain countries in some parts of the world, they could also benefit from those things. And if one teacher is given the opportunity to learn how to use this, that teacher can go back and teach another 10, the 10 could teach another 10, another 10, that exponential effect will be beneficial to the system. So um, it needs a coordinated effort, you know, where you identify a particular problem in a particular country and then see how that can be addressed. And that will involve working with the associations, either the national association or the continental associations. And we take this conversation to the next level where we could possibly get support for the teachers that really need the support. Thank you. Are there any other questions or would anyone like to share based on uh, Dr. Effiong's presentation, how did you have to reset in your particular context due to COVID-19? Or were there pandemics in your context prior to COVID-19 that COVID-19 has exasperated, right? How are you soldiering on? Well, I, I, um, I'm not gonna answer that question directly, <laughs> but <laughs> I, um, I just wanna say that um, one, one thing that I, I learned from what you just said, Okan, and what I think resonated with me um, perhaps the most was how relative the concept of disaster is in different contexts around the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> one's, uh, one person's disaster is another person's normality. And I think that's where the injustice lies. Um, you know, we, we think that we're suffering uh, in this country if, um, if we can't buy um, uh, uh, Alexis, <laughs> and we have to settle for um, a Cadillac, you know, th that's some people's idea of a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, other people's idea of a disaster is um, not being able to feed their families, not being able to afford $3 for a battery because you only make $70 a month, right. um, or et cetera. I mean, you know, there, there are plenty of, of examples that you gave, but I think that that's, that's extremely important. And um, helping people in, in the West and, and the developed countries to understand these disparities, I think is extremely important because a lot of people in the West, uh, especially in, in countries like the United States, are, well, there are no countries like the United States. The United States is much more aberrational than most of us really understand. So let's say in the United States, people really don't have a concept of how people in, in other parts of the world live. Um, so I, I, I think that, you know, um, your message, um, every part of your message, I think, needs to be heard. But that's, that's one part that I think really needs to, to, be, um, to be understood by people in the United States and uh, other places in the West. So I, I, I thank you for that and for inspiring all of us, uh, informing us and inspiring us. I, I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Mary? Um, we have Eve who wants to ask a question. Yes. Thank you so much. I want to um, really commend the speaker. And um, I can identify with every angle of the presentation because we all as teachers had 
all those things you identified to, um, that we encountered at some time. My concern is though, however, those students who we never even got to um, contact with because parents were truly unable to connect. And in going forward, we have national exams that students are required to write, whether it's at a certain age. And those students who have missed out, what then um, can be put in place or how are they going to fear going forward? Because we have seen the disparities between the, as, as you rightly said, the haves and the have nots. And sadly, the have nots are going to continue to be sidelined. So that's my concern going forward after this pandemic um, is over. What is going to be the, the, the outcome for those students who have really not been able to connect for the year plus that we have transitioned to the online school? Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Tasha, would you like to go ahead? Yes, thank you so much. And Okan, thank you for um, really kind of reorienting us to, you know, just some of the practical challenges that we have been facing in um, delivering instruction in this setting. Um, something I was just kind of responding to in the chat is um, something that we have a struggle with. Um, I'm teaching out of the US and I'm teaching um, pre-service teachers in a university setting. And of course we went to remote learning as well. And so tech was no issue whatsoever, exactly what you were referring to, Okan. But what has been prior to the pandemic continues to be an issue for us, which is seeing each other. Um, and what I mean by that is tech allowed a, a lot of folks to continue to separate into their own little communities. And so what that means is I have the tech, I don't really need to engage in a serious way if you're trying to teach me to learn about folks who are not like me in any way, um, I, I'm not even getting into this engagement with the folks in my very own class anymore, um, which usually was the place where you could kind of um, design for more humanized interactions. And then once the pandemic came, folks really separated, right? So like you were pointing to, cameras off, audio off, and you're trying to have them have deeper critical discussions about these disparities that we're talking about as my students in particular are preparing to be teachers. And so it's just interesting how there are some things that tech can't fix. Um, and so whatever kind of strategies and approaches we're using face-to-face, -face, um, looking for ways to um, augment them and then transfer them into the digital sphere so that we have folks who are not just kind of staying in their bubble, like I have what I need, it has nothing to do with me, you know, like that's over there and I'm over here. Um, and in a global context, oftentimes we think of the global north, the global south, but within one state, I'm in a very small state in New Jersey, um, from one block to the next, um, this block has everything they need and more excess, multiple cars, throwing away brand new computers, and the next block has no connectivity, has no food, right? And so we actually have this disconnect, um, not just between the global north and the global south, but that's, you know, the global kind of blackness that we experience is, is similar situations right within very small spaces. So I just so appreciate understanding that we're dealing with multiple intersecting and sometimes contradictory challenges. We need more tech, but also some things tech can't fix. So I'm, I'm just so enthralled listening to um, the different perspectives and the different approaches of how do we like ameliorate some of these things. So I just appreciate um, your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Tasha. Any more questions? Just uh, my last word then is, um, what is obsolete in your context, maybe cutting edge in my context? So don't just bin it, think of how you can ship it across. We'll welcome them with open arms, please. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Keisha, would it be okay for people to continue asking questions and making comments? Sure, that's fine. I'm just Great. looking at the chat to make sure that we're covering everything. Well, if someone has something in the chat that they would like to say, that, um, if they put it in the chat because they didn't feel that they would have time to say it, um, they, they can certainly say it now if they would like to. Ulrich Schrader, would you like to, to make a comment or ask a question? I saw that you just wrote something in the chat. So can I just ask a quick question? Sure. To teachers, well, for me here in Japan, I've had high school and university students who were not used to using computers. So I've had classes where I've had to teach my students how to use PowerPoint or how to use certain um, programs, apps. Then I guess most students are used to using their cell phones but not as many are used to using computers. I'm just very curious if any teachers had to navigate that. I know for me, it was challenging trying to understand where any kind of breakdown in what the student was doing was happening and then work my way back to taking them through the steps of, okay, this is how you fix it or just directing them to the language sensor and say, hey, call them and they'll sort it out for you. I'm just curious as to if anyone else had to go, had to handle, juggle that and how that went for you. If I may. Mm -hmm. Sure. Hi, Lisa. And um, thank you, Dr. Okun, for sharing with us. And I'm, I'm just m managing many thoughts and how to respond to this session because as a Jamaican, having um, lived abroad for a while, knowing what is happening like back home in different rural settings, and also living in a nation where the facilities are here, just to, to, to think, how do I, how do I respond from a place of conscience to this type of presentation, you know? But Lisa, let me answer your question first. Um, here in Azerbaijan, for me, we have also seen some of the, the questions of how do students use their devices in lessons. Um, they're not submitting their homework and these are students who I think their families are wealthy enough to be able to buy devices, but they're not participating, not joining lessons, and it came down to a matter of not knowing how and so even as the teacher of English, I had to begin teaching technology and showing the students like using half of a lesson sometimes. This is how you log in. This is where you find this button step by step. <laughs> and, um, and so I think that part of our flexibility as teachers now is to know that we also have this additional responsibility to bring our students into that other part of learning or the, the necessary part of learning now, which is managing the technology. But I also had students who didn't join because their parents just don't have funds to buy a device. And I, we also drew on project-based learning this year but it still didn't give us the chance to reach everyone. You know, um, we didn't have all of the resources ourselves to go find the students and maybe we're not expected to go find them because of our context. But um, I think about how these discussions out of Africa or some of the developing regions um, want to stress the, the need for a technology, so to speak. 
And I just think that sometimes taking the second hand recycled technologies or devices from other places might not be the best solution. Um, we know how to, like I think Cheryl said before, Tonwa and McFashion, we're totally creative people as Blacks across the world. And um, learning might look different in terms of the, the, the process, but we know how to make it happen. And part of the dependence on the Western world or the more developed world really troubles me personally. And it just continues to recreate coloniality in all sorts of spheres. And um, I'm really struggling to, to respond as, as an educator working in a developed mm -hmm. space, um, managing all of my ideas about um, what's happening in my home country, what I see in, in some of the, the place, nations of color and it's hard to 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 balance that yes i appreciate having my laptop i can join on zoom i don't have this challenge with connectivity but i'm also thinking if push comes to shove do i really need the laptop to learn and to teach you know let's answer this question <laughs> so i'll just stop sharing there thanks though really good conversation Thank you, Nadine. Appreciate that contribution. Please, the rest of you can, uh, we still have a few minutes. So anyone else would like to uh, share their experience or ask a question to Dr. Okan or uh, make a comment is perfectly welcome to do that. Ulrich Schrader was going to um, share before. Okay. Yeah, Sorry if you're waiting. Uh, share with us. No, that's fine. Um, no, I was just drawing. Hello, everyone. Um, the comparison and analogy with the haves and the have-nots discussion that was earlier uh, to the vaccines and healthcare systems and the priorities of the governments and uh, NGOs and international organizations and governments, specific governments. And um, that was all. Um, the analogy between what is the priority, uh, education or medical care at the moment, um, the vaccinations particularly. That was my only comment. Thank you. Okay, so we would like to um, thank Dr. Okan um, for his wonderful presentation. Thank, thank you to the group um, for your insightful uh, response and feedback and your questions um, is greatly appreciated. Continue to jot down your questions as we go through the sessions today. There will be a time for Q&A as well at the end of the symposium. So again, I want to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because we are all in different parts of the world. I am privileged to introduce our next two presentations by Cheryl Ann Dean and Justin Gerald. Um, these presentations are based on the theme of internalized ideologies and perceptions of linguistic abilities. Cheryl, are you ready? Yes, I am. I would like to share my screen. So, trying to figure out share screen. Let's go. All right, how is it looking for you guys? I need to put it on, I need to put it on slideshow. Looks great. Colorful. <laughs> Thank you. And that gorgeous young lady in the middle is my student. <laughs> All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Shirelle Ann, and I'm going to make my little contribution today from my little corner in Jamaica. Um, I'm an MPhil PhD student at the University of the West Indies, Mona campus, and I am a 20 plus year veteran of teacher as a teacher of English here in Jamaica. Um, my work, well, this particular presentation this morning is an it's a prelude to a chapter that I'm putting together 
for a, uh, a book from our beautiful Remy. <laughs> we are working together on this chapter, this contribution, and it's really about getting an understanding of what it feels like to be a teacher of English in a Creole speaking situation, in this particular case, in a Jamaican Creole classroom. And what happens with this presentation is that the it is really built up of stories. So I'm going to be telling you because the research itself to put together the chapter, the research itself is what we, we, we put together a narrative ethnography kind of thing where we look at storytelling and the stories of the students, the stories of the teachers and my own involvement in the story process. How, what does it feel like being a student in the classroom from a narrative perspective, right? So these students are never afraid to talk to me. I don't know if it's my face, my voice, but they always want to talk to me. Um, so we have, uh, I have been doing quite a bit of work. So the stories that you are going to be hearing or the, the situation I'm going to be explaining and the stories I'm going to be telling, they are based on a particular project that I started some 20 years ago. It's called the RCLIP or the Reading Clinic Literacy Intervention Program. Oh, let me not get into too much of that because I'm going to explain it later. So the RCLIP plus there's a six form program that I started and then there's a student support program that I also did, which would bring in the extracurricular part of their whole development. So for me, when I'm teaching, I'm talking about teaching the whole whole student. It's not just about English, because for me, English is really just a medium. It's just one way of getting our students to communicate their thoughts and their ideas. And I'm beginning to realize that, you know, anyway, later on. <laughs> so I've done a couple of things that, I, well, there are a couple of things that I'm still working on that will come up as well as a part of the support of what I'm doing here. I have redesign and remodel the CSEC English A. So if you're from the Caribbean and you know anything about it, our, ex, our external examinations are from a body called the Caribbean Examination Council. And they set, um, they set, hold on, I think I need to do something here. Um, it's okay. Right. They do exit examinations at the grade 11 and then again at grade 13. So they have advanced proficiency courses for an additional two years. And what I have done is to basically redesign how we teach them and particularly because of this COVID. So I had mentioned earlier in, in my comment to, to Ocon that I wanted them to use projects and the traditional project-based learning approach is not exactly what I've done, but it's like a modification of that. And allow the students to use themes to bring out their, their thoughts and ideas and to be able to write comfortably in the target language, which is English, of course. And then of course, being at UA as a student, I also am teaching there and I teach in the language section of the humanities faculty and I started a research project. It's still it's still on the write up. So it's the bilingual biliteracy initiative for UWI students. So I have taken this method, this change in methodology from the high school into the university, and they have actually sanctioned that particular research to see if the methods used successfully with the high school students can be replicated in the, at the tertiary level with the students of the critical reading and writing course, particularly Fountain 90. Right, so how I'm going to present this, it's three sections. So I'm going to have to try to see if I can talk really, really fast, right? So part one, you have the understanding of the classroom space. What does that mean? And I'm going to explain the whole art clip thing to you again. And then we have two stories that I'd want to tell you to support understanding. So you get a better understanding of what the space is like. So that's how I'm going to present each of the sections. Section two, what does the new instruction look like? And section three, what are the policies, right? And the politics, it's really politics, but in Jamaica, we like to say politics, right? Involved in 
getting this particular methodology out, using this particular methodology. And again, they're all fixed up nicely with stories. All right, so for the purpose of the book, it's basically quantitative with a mix of action, participatory, and narrative ethnography hybrid model. Um, the data that is captured is in the form of stories again, from both the teacher's perspective and the student perspective as they describe the Creole space, the classroom space. And um, yeah, so this is basically where the whole presentation now starts, where we get into the story of it. So the first story is them not full full, right? Um, when I started teaching, when I got involved in all of this, I remember going to a job interview, right? And the, the nice lady said to me, you know, come and present to us about, you know, what you know about teaching language and, you know, literacy. These are students that are in high school. No, but high school, by the way, these are 12 year olds, right? On average, 12 year olds, they've started high school, right? Remember this, they've started high school. No. She said to me to bring something to show her about how I would teach the students in high school, you know, help them with their language. So, of course, I picked up and got my boss lesson plans and everything and my unit outline. And when I went to the interview and I sat in there, I, she was actually in the middle of doing some tests that I later found out was some diagnostic tests. So the micro, um, it's actually a literacy diagnostic test. And she is sitting in front of a little girl and the little girl could not read the pre-primer script. Now you have pre-primer, primer, grade one, grade two, grade three. Now, please remember this is a high school, you know, so I went in to teach a grade seven class. She gave the child the pre-primer script and the child could not read it. So she said, okay, no worry, you know, deal with the effective stuff. She said, okay, I'm going to give you a different sheet and I want you to just, tell me the letters that you know by the way do you know the letters of the alphabet she said yes so the little girl started to sing it's like a b c d and she went off and she sang the alphabet so they said good job now and she pointed to a letter and she said which letter is this and the child looked at the t and said r at this point my heart sank because i'm saying it cannot get any worse than this this is crazy so the thing is, this little girl is sitting in front of me in high school, grade seven, not even being able to identify letters of the alphabet, having spent six years in primary education. So I don't even want to get into all of that because that is section three, <laughs> part three, where we talk about how did this, how did we allow this to happen? As a nation, as a people, how did we allow this to happen? Once I started teaching them, of course, my method is to get them to speak to me. Because once they get comfortable talking, speaking and sharing, then you would now realize exactly just how much they know. So I started talking to the students and I'm realizing that, hold on a second, these kids are not special needs. These kids are not students that we would consider foo fool. Them don't dance. What is happening to them is that they are being tested, given an assessment in a language that is not theirs. Because they were able to talk to me and tell me about the most complicated, abstract, detailed things in Jamaican. Once they talk patwa to me, they're comfortable and they are able to explain everything to me. Now that I'm giving them something, I'm giving them now a test in a foreign language. And of course the child is going to fail. So once the child fails the test, they are now placed in what we call special programs or special needs programs where they are now, their absence of literacy in English is paired with their level of intelligence. And this is a huge problem that I am out to fix. So a different incident that helps you to, um, to help us to understand our situation is of Christopher. Now, I have told this story before. So those who attended the, ATS, the ATC conference some years ago would remember. Christopher lived in deep rural Jamaica, right? So he came from the hilltop mountains of Clarendon, right? And he 
his family relocated to uh, Portmore, to Kingston nearby, and he spoke deep Creole, right? Now, his Creole was so deep, so raw, that once he opened his mouth to speak, everybody would pay attention because it sounded so distinctly different. So Christopher was in the classroom one day, as usual, with my students, and he came up to me and he said, Miss Bikanga Abachum, <laughs> right? And I took the opportunity, because now this is an opportunity now for me to teach, you know. So I said to him, absolutely, but you will have to ask me that again in English, Christopher. And he looked at me, I looked at me, and then he bawled tanks and dash through the door. <laughs> so I, I shouted out to him and said, Christopher, come back here. Come right back here, sir. Christopher, I say, you can't go to the bathroom if you ask me in English, and that I say. And he looked at me and he looked at the class and he said to me with his best American accent, Miss, I can't go back to you. Now, at that point, the entire class was in uproar. Everybody was just laughing because for Christopher, his idea of speaking English was to attach an American accent <laughs> to what it is that we were, whatever it is that he's supposed to say, he's to make it sound as if he's in America. Of course, all of it was just wrong. But that is basically what a Creole classroom looks like, what it sounds like. These students are, and I'm going to talk about our, um, how the schools are set up with this whole equity thing, which is a big thing for me later on. So how do I fix this um, construction now? So in the classroom, when the students come to me, because once we go through and we test all the students, right? So that's the first thing that we do. We use their scores, their mark schemes that they had coming from primary school. What we do is we bring them over to grade seven we do an analysis of the scores, look at their areas, particularly for the communication task and the, the language arts scores. We look at it, we look at where the weaknesses are, and then we do our own diagnostics for literacy, not intelligence, just for literacy. So I'm now able to ascertain what level literacy the students are at. And even though this may sound like streaming, it really isn't because the program, as I'll explain a little bit, is very different in how we, we, how we put it together. So we pull the students that we find are functioning below grade five. So in our justification, we would say grade five and six, they probably could use a little tweaking and they should be able to manage the grade seven curriculum. But if you're reading at grade five, below grade five, four and, and, and lower, you would have had some significant challenge with the material, with the texts, with the syllabus that have been prepared for you for grade seven. So what we do is we test all of them and we establish exactly where they're reading at. We do for numeracy as well to assist the math, the, the math and numeracy department, but our focus really is on, on the literacy. And we pull them and we create for them specialized classes that we call clinics, reading clinic literacy intervention program. And it's the ARCLIP. And this particular program is set up specifically for students that are Creole speakers that are functioning below their level of literacy. Right now, all the teachers come together. So I would meet with all of the teachers who will be teaching them in that class. So whether it's, um, by the way, the language teacher is a resident teacher, meaning the language teacher will teach science, social studies, religious education, whatever else other academic program they have. It's the one teacher that does it. And that teacher will focus all of the the, the content and everything, the methodology around teaching to read. So even in the social studies lesson, the focus is on teaching them English. So all of their content is still, it remains, but the focus is on language development, English language development. Once they are coming through that program now, then we support that 
with the counseling part of it and the affective part of it and the extracurricular programs that will help them to, to utilize this energy and express themselves in this in, in, in the most appropriate way for them. Um, Dennis Craig is the go-to person because our language policy, unfortunately, has been in draft mode since 2001. And in the policy itself, there were several options that were presented by some renowned, renowned writers um, and practitioners in this area, Dennis Craig, um, Beverly Bryan, and several others. They, they spoke about how we can, what options are available to Jamaica and to the Jamaican Creole speakers as it pertains to language education. And he presented five options. But because the original, if we go back, the slide before indicated that we are using the fourth option, which would only be to use Jamaican Creole as a means to get them to English. So it is what we call um, mono literate bilingualism. So they, we want to get them to literacy only in English, but we recognize the fact that they use Jamaican and with they, they're allowed to use it and so on in on the play field for fun times, but it's really, it has no place in the classroom because you're really supposed to be using every opportunity to get them to, to get them, I think I needed to go back, right. Monoliterate bilingualism, the point is really just to get them back to to get them to mono literacy in English. Now, the fifth option he had on, in terms of his proposal was for us to be bilingual, biliterate, which means both languages would be developed fulsomely. So they have Jamaican Creole in its full form with everybody, teacher and students learning and becoming literate in Jamaican and also being literate in English. Now, in my instruction, what I do in the classroom is specific to this because the, the activities that are created in the classroom is that for the students to do translations. So if a student says something to me like, Miss Mwanga Abachum, I'm going to write that on the board and create an opportunity, a learning um, opportunity for them to actually translate what does this mean in English. So it therefore means that the instructor would have to know much about the phonology of Jamaican, all of the syntactic differences, syntax and grammar, and the pragmatics of it. And of course, with the idioms and so on, they would have to understand what those are so that when they're making the changes, the changes can they will, the child will be able to see that there are two distinct structures, two different distinct patterns. And once what I have found in my 20 plus years is that once they have identified the differentiation in the structures in the two languages, they don't make the kinds of errors anymore in English that have plagued our system for so long, right? So you will find that students would write something in their papers like the children them are playing. And once you see items like that, it is a rich opportunity for you to take that miss, <laughs> that mistake and teach through it. So you teach them what the phonological issues are in that sentence. You teach them what the syntactic issues are and show them the distinction between the two. But again, the teacher must be cognizant. The teacher has to be trained in linguistics in this particular portion specifically so that they can adequately do that. And there is no more excuse because the Castle La Page writing system is now available. There's a full dictionary. I think I have my copy here, if you can see. We have the dictionary of Jamaican English right here. We have so much material that is actually out there now available for them to use. It's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. So, Again, now with the instructions, I can tell you a couple more stories. I'm not even sure how much time I have, right? But I can tell you a couple more stories. This one is about Shelly. Shelly is another student that I had in a different session, but for this session, we were going to do narrative. So on the CXC, we're supposed, they're supposed to write stories, right? So they do narrative. There's a section for narrative writing. 
And I said to them, okay, we're gonna start the lesson by us telling stories, telling our own stories. So Shelly came up to the board and I said, okay, listen now, there are two rules to this exercise. You have five minutes, I'm not going to stop you. You're gonna tell me a story about the most memorable experience you've ever had in your life. Now, you only have five minutes and the other rule is you must tell me the story in English, straight standard Jamaican English. Shelly went up there and she struggled, maybe like about three minutes, two minutes out of the five minutes. She struggled to tell me about the experience, but I let her stand there for the five minutes so she could understand the space, the amount of time she still had left. When the five minutes, the very uncomfortable five minutes was up, I said, don't move Shelly, I want you to tell me the same story, the same rules, except this time, you're going to tell me the story in Jamaican. And Shelly, cha 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 Shelly, talk, 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 straight through. I was like, okay, time's up, Shelly, time's up. And she just kept telling her story. And I used that as a classroom experience for them to show them that, listen, it's not that you lack content. It's not that you don't know what to write about. It's that you are forced, you're being forced to write it in a language or to speak in a language that you're not comfortable with. So you are, you're limited, you're timid about expressing yourselves. So what I allow them to do is write out their stories in Jamaica. No worry too much if them can't spell it and all of that. Write out your stories and then we translate. So they create like a gloss, right? So I show them the difference about transliteration and translation and what does that mean? And then you end up with the, the students being able to write good stories, not just in English, but in Jamaican as well. So you have my set of students will be coming through my hands, being able to do both, right? So that's the experiment. And then there's the teacher side of it. So when the teachers observe what I'm doing, I will, because at one point I was head of department and I said to one of my, my teachers, why did you mark this wrong, right? So particular, we're talking about a particular assessment for a student. Why did you mark this particular sentence construction wrong? And the teacher looked at me dead in the eye and said, Miss, it just not look right. The teachers themselves, and this is, this is just an indicator of what is pervasive. The language teachers themselves understand that this particular structure is not English. However, they cannot explain why it is not English because the child would have used English words. But they're looking at it and they're saying it just doesn't look right. It means, therefore, that we need to go back to the drawing board, go back to teacher education and training, teach bilingual biliteracy, and allow them to understand the separation of the structures themselves so that they can better instruct the students, which is why we are struggling so much to get the students to learn English, because we cannot separate the two, neither the students nor the teachers, nobody, right? Another teacher, when he's presenting, he is uh, saying that he doesn't like when somebody comes to visit him when he's teaching because I know so him talk when he might teach. So <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? Say, when, when there's no assessor in the class or nobody observing, he's able to use him, part one, everything on him. He makes sure same talk for the people them understand what he must say. But once they come on that supervisory role, they take the, any kind of supervisor, the language now becomes strained and he hates it. So he now hates teaching English because he don't want nobody to look funny because he don't feel comfortable. These are some of the issues that the students are having going back and forth from year in, year out. And until we all come together and get past the politics, we should be able to do something better for it. Now, when we talk about politics in Jamaica, I talked about RPIP, and you're probably asking how students reach this up. Well, in Jamaica, we have a good school, bad school thing, right? Where you go to traditional high school or a non-traditional high school. The traditional high schools are steeped in culture. So they are coming all the way back from colonialism and the plantation master and their children and all that went to those schools and they, are, they still exist, right? These schools are there. Now, of course they have included us now or the Negroes are now included and we are back in, we are able to attend those schools but there are certain elitist systems and structures that are still in place that allow for these culture, this, this elitist class culture to be maintained. 
And then the ministry having a systemic problem will now actually place students in class in their schools, sorry, based upon these issues. And one of the issues is that how them sound when they are talk. So when they go into their grade six examinations to place them in high schools, they look at what their language scores are like, look at what their communication tasks, and if you're so-called dunce, you go to the dunce school or the newly upgraded high schools. And then the system just keeps churning out more of what we do not want. And then you have the bright ones now who would go to the bright school or the traditional high school. And then when you talk to the kids, when they come to a school that is deemed non-traditional, right, in the back of their mind, they're already, there's a culture, there's a mindset that they're at a done school. So all of the affected stuff, all of, poor Miss Dean, <laughs> Miss Dean and to our other colleagues are the ones now who are going to have to try to not just teach English, which is why I'm so big on the whole child teaching, right? You have to fix the mindset. You have to fix the mindset of the teachers and you have to fix the mindset of the students. That's a huge task. It's been 20 plus years. I can't say how far I reach, but I try, right? The Jamaica language unit has my back, I can tell you, because all of the resources and stuff that I need, the Jamaica language units established through a parliamentary um, petition, they, they got the rights to go ahead, do their thing. They set up the Jamaica language unit and they provide support for people like me and anybody else who's interested in using Jamaica and Creole as a platform to teach, to sensitize the public, to do all of that kind of stuff. They had a bilingual education program. They have done attitude and competency surveys. We have had petitions to the government for the officialization of Creole. They have had, we have had a Bible translation project. By the way, this is our Pato Bible. Yay. So the New Testament is actually now we have it in Jamaican Creole. There is so much work that is going on with it. And the last thing I want to say on this is that the, it's a human rights issue. It is a human rights issue. When I talk about the children in the classroom, the UN Convention Article 2 speaks to non-discrimination against children based on language. And we have to now speak to this matter I speak here on a national level and know I'm on a global platform and I'm saying it. We need to advocate for the rights of these kids in the language that they speak because they are not dunce. Them no fool fool. All right, so that's it for <laughs> my presentation. I think I did it in time. I didn't hear a bell, yay. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much. Hello, everybody. So wonderful presentation. Um, we appreciate Cheryl and uh, the information that she has shared. If anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat. We'll moderate that. Uh, and I would like to see if um, Mr. Justin Gerald is ready. Yep. OK, you can go ahead, and then we'll have Q&A at the end. All right. Hold on a second. I think I have to do this thing where I only share part of the screen. I'm gonna, I gotta do it again. Hold on. To do an advanced version where I share part of the screen. There we go. That way I can see my notes. There we go. Okay, so uh, a little bit about me. I guess I should have waited because now it's just a little head on top of the screen, but whatever. Uh, my name is Justin or JPB Gerald. Uh, I go by my initials because anything that's going to be cited is going to be my last name anyway. Uh, I am a doctoral candidate at CUNY Hunter College in New York, uh, born and raised in New York also. Um, I, my degree will be an EDD in instructional leadership, which could mean anything, but what I'm choosing to do with it is I, I wasn't planning this when I started it, but I ended up focusing on, um, broadly speaking, whiteness in education, but also whiteness in language education because my master's is in TESOL and, you know, I've been affiliated with these various things over the years. Um, 
my dissertation is going to be on, uh, I created some after, you know, last year after people started talking about stuff, because um, they get interested every few years, you know, uh, I created some whiteness classes and people took them and I'm interested to be like, who are the white educators who take a whiteness class, right? Because not everybody does. I don't really think that a lot of these trainings work on people who don't want to be there. They're just not going to listen. But who is the person who chooses to show up and what happens afterwards? So that's what the dissertation is on. I'm also writing a book. The, the dissertation isn't specifically on language education. It's just on education in general. But the, uh, the book that I'm writing is about the centering of whiteness and language education. A lot of things that that's tied to, because there's a lot of stuff, you know, if you look at the history related to like disability, I know that uh, Cheryl Ann was talking about intelligence and language being conflated, which I'll mention here. Um, and of course, conceptions of race, racism, blackness, and so on. Uh, and then what we might be able to do about it, which I'm tying into my dissertation research. So that's uh, what all that is. And this presentation is based on one of the chapters in the book, well, the manuscript that I'm currently writing. Um, and it's about, uh, you know, the way some of my students in the past have perceived themselves and what that has been tied to, um, or my conception of what that's been tied to. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. So it's called Bad at English, the White Listener and Student Skills Perception. So um, at a previous position that I had, I was the manager for an adult education program at a nonprofit uh, in New York, which offered, among other things, free English classes. Now, our students came from a lot of places. I would say the majority came from either Latin America or East Asia. Um, among the former group from Latin America was a woman who, when I asked, like I did of everybody, why she wanted to take the classes, she told me that she had come to feel that she had hit a professional ceiling uh, because of the way her speech was perceived. She was seen as foreign, regardless of what she said, even though she was American. She was Puerto Rican, that is, of course, America. Uh, along similar lines, several of my Japanese students were, and I don't know that I love this phrase, but they were highly educated women who were unable to work legally because of our arcane visa restrictions for spouses of professionals. So they came to our classes to improve their English, but it became clear to me rather quickly that even by the constructed standards of dominant forms of American English, there was nothing quote unquote, wrong with their writing or their speaking. Sure, there would be an error here or there, but anyone who wanted to understand what they were saying could have done so without too much effort. Even people who weren't language teachers like I was or like many of you are. I kept hearing a refrain from all of these students that they were bad at English. And though I regretfully never had the wherewithal to ask them who had told them that that was true, instead of some mystical level of improvement to which I was supposed to elevate them, I knew I was working against something other than grammar rules, right? It clearly wasn't just that they didn't know how to use the language. At the time, I made the mistake of thinking that I simply needed to help them improve their confidence. And I did need to do that, but it wasn't just that. And since they did grow comfortable in my classroom, they did indeed be, you know, appear more comfortable making use of all of their linguistic gifts with me and their classmates. My attempts fell short at supporting them outside of our unique and comforting environment, though, because I didn't really understand what they and many language students, especially in an English dominant place, were up against. And I didn't at all know why they would perhaps always be seen as deficient in their use of English. I was right to notice that their, the issue wasn't really their ability, but believing their issue was solely their confidence instead was still you know, an example of a deficit mindset that I had because I was still blaming it on them. And it doesn't at all speak to the greater forces at play that were responsible for this supposed lack of fortitude. Unfortunately, like many language teachers, I hadn't consumed any of the scholarship that my work now uh, includes. And I was still searching for like a silver bullet that would fix my students. Uh, I knew intuitively that there was something wrong with the system that would lead these students to have internalized the deficiency that had been placed upon them. But I still thought of language in a detached, disembodied way, not yet able to fully consider how their identities played a central role in the fact that they believed that their English, exemplary even by oppressive standards, was in fact bad. Only later would I come to understand the powerful ideologies in play. And indeed, part of the reason I've done this work is that I can't go back and tell them, because this is in the past, where the problems really were. But I can tell you. 
So on racial linguistic ideologies, many of you who are going to be here know some of this, but it's important to include. So as Flores and Rosa say, and I'm not gonna read all of that, but uh, racial linguistic, uh, racial linguistic ideologies produce racialized speaking subjects who are constructed as linguistically deviant, even when engaging in linguistic practices positioned as normative or innovative when produced by privileged white subjects. I said I wasn't going to read all of it, and then I did. So any language training program, whether it's a master's degree, certification, CELTA, whatever it is, and I'm sure it's different in every country, uh, it's important that we make sure that people who are being trained in this profession are intimately familiar with these concepts and how they intersect with people's identities. My own now extinct, well, it'll be extinct in about a year, uh, master's program didn't have the option of teaching me this because these articles hadn't been published yet and I graduated in 2012. But if people are seeing this presentation now or watching the video whenever it's posted and have any influence on future language teachers, then we have no excuse not to make sure that people understand this intimately. So these ideas, sorry, these ideologies, which are hardly monolithic, right? They're very different and they depend on their context, but they're deeply powerful. They position these languagers in opposition to and below white individuals and institutions that have made themselves responsible for evaluating and approving of standardized English. Standardized English becomes associated with white bodies, a process called racial linguistic and registerment, right? And this has a wide ranging and long lasting impact on the racialized languagers with only people with certain identities being perceived as speaking with an accent, despite the fact that no matter how hard they might try to, white, uh, to mimic white approved English, they will always be seen as lacking because the bodies they inhabit and how those bodies they are, sorry, how those bodies are viewed. Racialized users of English will always be perceived as not quite good enough and asked to do just a little bit more, at which point they'll be told something else is wrong with their language. So, you know, since both monolingualism and stark language boundaries have been normed in recent decades or maybe centuries, racialized people who opt to mix unstandardized forms of English with other tools of, in their linguistic repertoire are not seen as gifted or creative, but instead seen as inferior in all of the standardized languages in which they are evaluated by what they call the white listener. Now, in my current work, I might argue that this denigration of unmistakable innovation is tied to the way that the racialized have long been infantilized or constructed as disabled, uh, lacking in intelligence, as we heard in the last presentation, to the point where all of their capabilities are automatically and necessarily dismissed. Consider the fact that a white politician, such as the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg in the United States, is internationally feted for his intelligence because of his skill with European languages, while many racialized people are instead viewed as almost without language because while capable of translanguaging, they don't conform to expected standardization. This language is, this let, this a hard word to say, languagelessness pervades both external and internal perceptions of the racialized with those classified as deficient in standardized English being seen as without a true language altogether. These perceptions are continuously reified by institutions, assessments, and powerful cultural norms. And here's a quote, uh, through standardizing institutions, people are socialized to racial linguistic ideologies about more or less legitimate language practices, the context where they can be used and the people who use them. Whereas familiar language ideologies might point towards what language choices are appropriate for a given circumstance, viewing these ideas, sorry, viewing these issues through the additional lens of racial linguistic ideologies helps us understand how a person's classification will necessarily render their languaging illegitimate, even if their English perfectly matches the imposed standard. This widespread set of norms leads to the same sort of trap into which the students I mentioned above had fallen. Their English would always be perceived as bad because they were categorized as people who are not associated with standardized English. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about a student assessments and how this keeps these ideas in play. So uh, I told you I was working for a nonprofit in New York or in Manhattan, and uh, these ideologies had a concrete impact on my own program and my students' progress, far beyond the nebulous nature of their own you know, negative self-talk. Like that was bad, but that wasn't a concrete impact. 
So to assess our students' progress, we were obligated to rely upon a particular oral exam that was approved of by the city agency that was providing us with the yearly grant that supported our program and also paid my salary. Uh, so any such money comes with strings attached. They're not just going to give you the money. And the biggest thickest string was the oral exam that each student had to take at the start and the end of every quarter or semester or whatever. So part of the reason I was even hired for that job is because at a previous position, and we know in this field, we all have a bunch of jobs over the years. Uh, my employers at that job had funded my certification in administrating that exam. And that's part of the reason I ended up with this, that job. So this test is widespread popular and trusted, and I'll tell you what it is if you want to ask me later, and the data that emerges from it is seen as both reliable and valid, so, but it is also completely beholden to and supportive of racial linguistic ideologies. So this test is a series of questions, starting off basic, what's your name, that kind of thing, and gradually becoming more complex, and they're posed to students in one-on-one -on -one interviews, which are mandated to be conducted at a specific 90-degree angle. Like you're both supposed to sit at the table. You're not supposed to look directly at each other. It's weird, but they must have some data behind it. Anyway, these students were supposed to answer these questions, and we were to rate their responses across th three variables or three metrics. How well they understood what we asked, which is pretty straightforward, how complex their answers well were and how well we understood their responses. I hope you can see how there might be some issues with these determinations, but the test company gave us very specific instructions, even more specific than the angle at which we were supposed to sit. For example, some of the questions only required a yes or no response to be answered accurately. For example, I one of the questions I remember was, did you drive here? That's not a, you, there's no, you, the answer to that is yes or no, right? Uh, but while we were being trained, the company employees told us explicitly that a one word answer was to be marked as the lowest score for complexity, even though it's correct. The first several dozen times I administered the test, I followed the rules, I marked these perfectly grammatical and complete sentence of no as insufficiently complex. But eventually this started to bother me and I re refused to go along with their evaluation suppression game. Along similar lines, because I had spent however many years teaching English learners or whatever we want to call these students, I was able to understand almost anything someone was attempting to convey. Like, I understand what they mean, regardless of how imprecise it was or what their supposed accent might have been. This meant I was prone to rating people very highly on whether or not I could understand them. In conversations with white colleagues about our students and their evaluations, I was told that students such as the one I've mentioned throughout this presentation should be rated poorly on what one might call intelligibility. Though it didn't ultimately matter that much because I was the only one giving the tests and I was fed up, so I stopped following the rules and just didn't listen. Uh, <laughs> they can't fire me now. It has helped me understand that without saying as much, we were not determining how well we ourselves understood the students, but rather how well the white listener would understand them. And with racial linguistic ideologies in place, their racialization would ensure that they were always seen as linguistically deficient. These students will always be bad at English under the system in place. Long we, unless we change it. So what was particularly, particularly insidious about this, though, was the fact that if I hadn't started ignoring the rules, I would have continued to provide evidence for their belief that their English was bad, and it would have been codified into official government data, because remember, it was the city that was paying us, right? These were free community classes, so they, they weren't really going to change. They weren't going to school. They were adults. They weren't necessarily trying to get a particular job. Ultimately, it didn't matter that much. But in some database somewhere, there's evidence that these students, by name, um, whom any one of you could understand just fine, are indeed, quote unquote, bad at English because they spoke in a way that the unnamed and unmentioned white public might have had to work slightly harder to process. So what racial linguistic ideologies do is, is, in place, is place an immense burden upon the racialized to prove their viability as communicators, and indeed their value as able human beings. And unless and until we confront these ways of thinking, then we'll still be telling our students that they are officially lacking. What's more, the students did tend to, quote unquote, improve on the tests I administered given at the end of the quarter, not particularly because of what they had learned in class, but merely because they were more comfortable with the person giving the exam 
me uh, and tended to speak in longer, more complex sentences just because they were kind of having a conversation with their teacher. In reality, the test company advised that the evaluation always be performed by a stranger at that awkward angle. And I am sure this was justified in their data, but it mostly just made everyone uncomfortable and tense and of course prevented people from speaking as freely as they otherwise might. In other words, Everything about the exam was designed in such a way that it underlined the inherently minoritized nature of these students' English. Let's go on another harmful concept. So the, con the connection between racial and linguistic ideology doesn't stop at the assessment and perception of those classified as English learners, of course. Even so-called native speakers of English, like many of us are, can be harmed by racial linguistic ideologies if they happen to be born into the wrong body. The construction of so-called standard English that only excludes other named languages, but classifies different expressions of English as inferior because of the groups with which they are associated. Consider the conundrum, as I'm sure almost all of you have been through, of being seen as both Black and articulate, a label that has been applied to me more than once in my life. It feels like a compliment and is surely meant as such, but the positive intentions cannot fully disguise the fact that the comment positions being, being black and being articulate as attributes in opposition to one another. As Clemenson wrote, when whites use the word in reference to blacks, it often carries a subtext of amazement or even bewilderment. It is similar to praising a female executive or politician by calling her tough or a rational decision maker. Even if it were to be taken as a compliment, it is by extension an insult to black languaging, which is seen as inherently inarticulate and deficient, deficient because of the way that blackness itself is viewed. Now, when I refer to black languaging, I'm speaking of what we call in the United States, either African-American vernacular English, African-American English, African-American language, whatever you want to call it, right? That's what I'm talking about. The debates over which name is the most appropriate are ongoing. I tend to say African-American English myself, now, though it has taken decades to even get to the point where people outside of the language studies community would even recognize black languaging as being of equal value to standardized English. Indeed, when I type African-American language into Google, and you should try this yourself, I still get slang as one of the top suggestions to help me in my search. And surely a few, few of you have read widely distributed academic like literature written in African-American English or even in Creole or something like that. It exists and I see that you're all trying, but there's still not that much of it, which means that even when research is about the way that many of us communicate, it is necessarily written at a slight remove from how we make meaning with one another. Black languaging is to this day considered illegitimate, inarticulate, unintelligent and lacking in capacity, yet this is not born simply of discomfort with perceived linguistic inaccuracy. Black languaging is deficient because blackness is seen as deficient. So I always struggle in talking about this, to this topic because here I am speaking in mostly standardized American English, thereby reifying this discrepancy between the perceived legitimacy of African American English and the language that whiteness would prefer us to consume. Uh, you know, African American English, or, and of course, not all of you are American, but various forms of Black languaging have entire sets of complex pronunciation and grammar rules, and that people who use it more frequently than I do while still navigating a society tied to standardized English are capable of linguistic feats that are beyond me, despite their being seen as less intelligent by those who tie language to ability, as they have been taught to. Alima Smitherman note that Black students can be in the habit of tapping into their rich linguistic repertoires while simultaneously being seen as incorrect by their own teachers who claim to care about them. I always spoke more or less like this when I was in school, and whatever my teachers thought of me, and this was a largely white school, they never had occasion to use my language to discredit me. In other words, I was always seen as articulate. But if I'm going to be seen as articulate, as art, it's funny that I mispronounced the word articulate, that's funny. Uh, if I'm going to be seen as articulate, what with my own exclusive institutional pedigree and far too many letters after my name after next year, then I might as well use what I know about communicating in a way that whiteness finds comfortable to take aim at the ideologies that are supporting it. There's nothing wrong with any of our Englishes, right? No matter how we employ the language, it is viable. No matter what our tests or our professors believe or we ourselves believe, our English is legitimate. And I hope after this brief presentation, we understand a bit better now how the way we're corrected and guided might be tied to perceptions of our identity. And I hope we all refuse to ever believe again that we or our students are bad at English. I'm done.
We see all the silent claps. Thank you. That was an amazing presentation. We had two presentations back to back that were just um, very informative. And uh, I would like to open up the floor for questions um, in the chat. Um, please do that at this time. Uh, I did take a snapshot um, of a question that was asked earlier of Cheryl. Um, it's from Andre Boyer. It says, are there any translation concerns with grammar structure between the languages? How do you account for them in the final products? Does it matter as long as communication aspect is met? And what would be a consequence if the translated product hindered communication? Now, there are several questions within that one. <laughs> All right. Um, let me see if I can take them apart. Um, one, there is the, yes, there is a, hold on a moment, please. She's occupied. I um, my son is struggling over here, so I'm gonna have to go in a second. I'll put all my contact in there, though. So for anyone who needs to contact, um, yeah. Sorry ahead. about that. All right. So the first part of the question asked me about um, translation. The translation has to come from the instruction of the teacher. So the student would have to be instructed on how to actually do the translation across, because it is not something that is taught to them in mainstream curriculum. It's not there. So for me, I have to teach it to them. What does the, the Creole structures look, what does the Creole structure should look like? And of course, what the English structure should look like. And then they start to make that translation for themselves. Of course, I guide them. Then there is also the issue of communication and communicating ideas. If it is an informal situation, if the translation is uh, um, understood, then we really do not get into the nitty gritties of it. There is also another thing that needs to be considered because for Jamaican, there is a continuum situation and the continuum situation, um, one Creole speaker in one side of Jamaica will have a different variety from the Creole speaker on the other side of Jamaica. So we have those things to contend with where the, the speaker comes from. We'll see variations in the translation as well. Um, I'm not sure I remember the last part of the question, but- um, I posted it so you can read it again. Yeah, if you could do that, that'd be great. Okay, hold on one so second. So translation for the classroom is, is done through the teacher um, yeah. Does it matter? It does matter if it is formal. So if it is something that I'm asking them to do for class, class work or for assessment, it does matter. If it is for regular classroom conversation and discourse or as a part of the teaching, the instruction, it really doesn't. Um, what are the consequences of the end product, right? The consequence is whether or not what the end product will be. So if the end product is really just for classroom conversation, um, for the discussion of how the translations would work, then it really doesn't matter. But once it becomes part of assessment, which I do in my program and for the research that I'm working on now at UE, it is also a part of the, um, the, translate, the, the assessment. So for example, there is, um, there is the situation where you get the students would be given a particular an essay to write, and then the, the first version must be Jamaican, and then the second version must be English. So in that context, the, we pay very close attention to how the translation work, and you're also going to be checked on how much of the structures you have actually learned and be able to apply. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Miss uh, Keisha Bryan, you had your hand raised. Did you have a question? Yes, absolutely. Um, two wonderful presentations for Cheryl Ann. This really struck close to home. Um, in the United States context, I'm actually from the low country of South Carolina, 
we are the Gullah Geechee people. Ah, and so, <laughs> and okay. so I believe that it is, it is the only English-based Creole that's spoken in the contiguous United States. And so we constantly have this as um, an issue. And so we're constantly trying to find ways to do like what you're doing, this contrastive analysis where you actually um, tell students your language is great. The language that you learned at home, this is the language that we're going to start with. And then it's that trying to get them to see it, but they see themselves as already proficient in the, and I'm not even going to say standard, they're the accepted form of English in the United States. And so it's really difficult, right, to actually um, help a lot of these students. And so I think the work that you're doing is absolutely amazing. I think it's even more difficult in, in this particular context in the United States, because again, we have teachers from all over the country and they're coming to teach in this beautiful place, Hilton Head Island, the coastal islands off of St. Helena Island, because it's beautiful. Everybody wants to live there. Everybody wants to teach there, right? But then you have the situation of the locals and not everybody knows the local language. And that becomes problematic because they're constantly teaching this form of English, the students are scoring poorly on these literacy assessments because this is not what they're learning at home. They're going into school, it's a totally different environment. So the whole idea of bilingualism, we need to reframe that to include different varieties of English because some of the issues are very much the same and we need to create spaces to kind of talk about that in the profession. So thank you definitely for your work. Thank you so much. And one of the things that really moves me and keeps me motivated, it's the look on their faces when they actually find out that, hold on, my don't dance. Right. <laughs> like, I'm not stupid after all this time, <laughs> right? One student in, in, in the advanced programs where I teach communication studies, she said, I really wish you guys had taught me all of this earlier because it makes a huge difference in terms of their self-esteem, how they feel about themselves. And for that reason, they, they project themselves into domains, into spaces for work, for employment, where they never saw themselves before. Right. So I'm saying, this, this can work. This is who you are, and it's not something you should shy away from. Your Blackness is beautiful. Your language is beautiful. And right. you have to teach that. You have to teach it. You need to have that voice. You know, that says to them that they're not, they are worthy. You know, it's not something for you to be ashamed of. Speak your truth. Use your voice. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Mr. Justin, are you, oh, okay. <laughs> um, we do have question. one more question for Cheryl, Cheryl Ann. I just wanted to be sure uh, to, I didn't want to skip any questions for Mr. Um, Gerald. So, Charlene, it says, to what extent would you say policy impacts your ability to use your approach? Well, fortunately for me, I was at a school, well, well all the institutions that I've got, maybe because I'm talkative and I speak loudly and passionately. I usually get my way, right? But <laughs> the truth is, the policies really does not, there's no structure in it, which is why I am attacking the language policy right now, because there is room in it for us to redo or to reconfigure ourselves. There is a fifth option, but we haven't looked at the fifth option because huh, it's not politically expedient to have everybody just suddenly wake up one morning and everybody brights, right? So they don't particularly want this. You, they're still, it, this is my opinion, it is extremely political, but it, it makes more economic sense for some people to still be in a particular corner of society. And they've figured that if we use language, because language is extremely powerful of a political tool, if we use the language, to empower the people, you can't still tell them the same foolishness. You can't still tell them, you know, that I know what is best for you because they now understand and are able to articulate exactly what they want and they know very well that you know what they mean, right? Where the, the language policy is concerned, it has been over a decade, what, what am I saying, 2001? 
yeah, that's that's a long time. They have still been trying to fix the policy. I am certain that there are persons here who can assist them with fixing the policy, but there's really not much motivation for that. So when I go to conferences or when I speak to the ministers of education and the stakeholders, they will say to you, great job, Cheryl Ann. We love what you're doing, Cheryl Ann, but they're not moved to change the system to accommodate what I'm doing. So my principal or my supervisors, they will support it. Um, I get a lot of support from parents. So I, I'm, I'm encouraged to continue to do what I'm doing, but there's not, to be very honest, there's not a lot of motivation from the, the, the government to fix the systemic part of it. There really isn't much motivation. Sorry. Thank you, thank you. Um, I do have a question from Andre Boyer um, for Mr. Gerald. If you'll go ahead and ask your question, Andre. Thank you all very much. I enjoyed the uh, presentations. Mr. Gerald, if I remember correctly, back from my research, uh, when I first started learning and understanding AAVE, whatever we want to call it, African-American vernacular English, I believe there was a statement from TESOL that uh, really codified and said that AAVE is a recognized uh, pattern of English. Has that changed from your, from your research or has that been added to uh, as you're studying um, this aspect? Uh, it's still there, right? You saw the one. It's from March 1997. I apologize. My son is probably crying in the background. Um, it's almost his nap time. So, um, but yeah, it's still there. Um, I would say that, you know, a lot of the official statements and stuff like that have been there and that's good and it recognizes it as valuable, but I still think that both the organization and the field um, are still a little bit too closely aligned with a lot of the hierarchies that um, are in place. So this, the, it's better that the statement has happened than that it didn't happen. But I don't think that they have put enough muscle and they have plenty of muscle behind legitimizing these things when they're you know, supporting various teaching policies and language teaching. Now, they, they're trying. In, in that sort of clumsy way, uh, you know, you see things. I mean, Keisha can tell you about them putting the DEI committee together this year. But uh, so, you know, I, I want to say check back two, three years, see what's happened. But I wouldn't say that because that was 97. Right. Uh, I wouldn't say that because of that. And I'm not saying you're, you said this. I'm saying I wouldn't say that because of that. Uh, TESOL has gone nearly far enough to support not just the fact that that is a legitimate version of English or a legitimate language, but to work against anti-Blackness in language teaching in general. Like, I, I just think there's a lot more that could be done and a lot more to support. All right, now I have to put him to bed. But thank, thank you, sir. You for your thank you. <laughs> thank you. And um, Farrar Little Page um, has a question. If you go ahead, Farrar. Um, my question was actually for Gerald. <laughs> oh, he's still here. Just one second. Maybe he can get you. You got like 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 a two second question. <laughs> it's not a two second question. Okay, just email Maybe me. I put my information later. there. I did. I put the I put <laughs> my information you. there. You can email me, and I'll figure it out. Okay, right. great. Thanks. Okay, thank you guys so much. I'm gonna turn it now um, over. Um, to our next set of presenters. So they are coming up at 11 o'clock hour. That is Yasmin Koksum and Sahadu Mosa and Kasum Diop. I think I hope I got that right. Uh, <laughs> uh, they are going to be presenting in our next um, topic of pandemic pedagogies and technology. Yasmin, are you ready? Yes, I am definitely ready. And I am so happy to see so many lovely, beautiful, colorful faces at this symposium today. Um, 
I just, it's really great. I'm really happy to be uh, participating uh, with you guys here today. Um, so my, you, you pronounced my last name correctly. It is Coxum. <laughs> so yes, I'm Yasmin Coxum and I um, am also in New York. Uh, I was born and raised uh, in New York as well. Um, I've taught in uh, four different countries. Um, and right now I am teaching at Long Island University Brooklyn campus. Um, and so it is a continuing education program. Uh, and the students are basically immigrants who are, um, I mean, who really need English in order to sustain their lives here. And so uh, that's my teaching context. And I'm doing something a little bit different in terms of the slides that I'm going to be uh, showing because I enjoy tech. And so I basically uh, pre-recorded my slides. And so this will give me a chance to also uh, keep an eye on the chat for any questions that, uh, that people might have. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead now and uh, share my screen. Hello and welcome to my presentation, Mutually Adaptive Learning Through Podcasting. The protocol I use for podcasting projects came about as a result of me really wanting to know the impact of using podcasts as the primary tool for instruction in a skills-based conversation and listening class in an intensive English program. Realizing that a colleague of mine at Long Island University, Helene Marshall, had developed a theoretical framework, the Mutually Adaptive Learning Paradigm, otherwise known as MALP, that brought to light how my protocol could be used as a way to address cultural gaps in teaching and learning styles is really what led to today's presentation. So what do you see when you look at this image? Okay, so that is actually a question that I would like you guys to answer, uh, either in the chat or, or if you want to unmute yourself uh, and tell me what you see when you look at this image. Okay, I'm looking at two faces or a vase. Okay. Well, I thought it was a bell. I saw a bell. A what? A bell. A veil. Okay. Face-to-face -face conversation. Okay. Interesting. Any, any two people facing each other? Okay. All right. Okay, so. So what do you see when you look at this image? Okay. Well, I'm starting with this optical illusion to illustrate the point that we all see the world differently. And those differences don't necessarily make your answers wrong or indicate that you're in some way lacking in artistic cognitive abilities. So, of course, we all come to see the world and take in information about the world based on prior experiences. And, of course, culture plays a huge role in the shaping of those experiences. So this is the basis of today's topic, which aims to introduce the culturally responsive teaching model, MALP. So what exactly is MALP? Well, it is a teaching model that facilitates a smooth transition from diverse learning styles that differ significantly from those of westernized formal education to those which can provide students with the tools they need to succeed in their academic endeavors within such a setting. It is a culturally responsive approach that really redirects the conversation away from a focus on deficit and remedial to one on different and preparatory. And finally, it is mutually adaptive because both educators and struggling learners are called upon to make shifts in their paradigm or their realities. So how are these paradigms and ways of learning so different from each other? Well, in formal westernized education, students believe in the promise of future reward from their education. Students will become independent learners who pursue individual excellence in their learning. And 
Finally, students arrive with the age appropriate background in literacy and can both learn and demonstrate mastery through print. So at least that is the ideology. Meanwhile, some students come from backgrounds where learning something new is immediately relevant to their lives. And over half of the world's cultures are collectivistic. So a higher value is placed on interdependence and not standing out individually. Now, some such cultures are Japanese, Venezuelan, Brazilian, and also Indonesian. These are just some examples. Um, so in addition, some students, especially those with limited or interrupted formal education, can better express themselves orally, or perhaps they are more used to oral transmission modes of learning. Well, MALP uses strategies that aim to bridge this gap so that students with these differing beliefs and styles are able to become more confident in their academic pursuits. So what is this podcasting protocol and how does it align with MALP? So first, let's talk about the listening protocol. So in step one, I select podcasts ranging in a scope of topics from eslpod.com down to business English and various authentic podcasts for native speakers. In the second step, I create worksheets uh, that include lead-in questions, gist, vocabulary, and detailed comprehension questions. And then next, the students listen to the podcast in class. So this is maybe two to three times, depending on the difficulty level of the material in that episode. And for step four, the students are asked to then summarize the main idea of the podcast and post it on our Padlet. And then during the next class, the students listen to the podcast episode again with specific focus on selected vocabulary words and phrases. And now to the production phase. In step six, in groups, students enter the meanings of the words and expressions on a Google Doc according to the context of the podcast episode. Then the terms are clarified for the whole class. In step seven, a homework task of recording a two to three minute podcast episode summarizing the content of the week's episode, perhaps discussing their opinion, uh, arguing for or against the perspective of one of the characters, or talking about a personal experience with the situation in the episode. Next, I provide individual feedback on the recordings via email. So I give them overall comments on the episode, specific language correction. And then of course, I let them know if they have used phrases well. Then in step nine, during the next class, the students are asked to write and perform conversations using at least half of the expressions from the worksheet. And in the final step, at the beginning of the next class, the latest episode containing all the students' recordings is played for students to comment on. And now for the connection with MALP. So among the strategies MALP uses to bridge the cultural learning gap are create relevance, create interconnectedness, and combine familiar and unfamiliar learning processes. And during the podcasting project, students listen to podcasts with topics relevant to different aspects of their lives. So for example, health, academics, or finance. Um, in addition, of course, they work together to create in-class conversations and podcast episodes. Uh, so that is your interconnected piece. And then uh, finally, also podcasting connects both written and um, oral methods of learning as students often write scripts in preparation for the recordings. Now let's play a sample of a student episode.
Welcome to season 2 of Yasmin's English Conversation and Listening Class podcast. Each week, our students summarize and discuss a podcast with analyzers in class. So, happy listening! Okay, so I'm going to move this along have all to a particular good day. that I would like you guys to listen to. So just give me a moment to do that. Coming up. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Eliona Agai. It is my pleasure to be with you on our weekly podcast. In this week's podcast, I'm going to talk about how COVID affected my life and what I'm doing to keep my family and myself healthy. Since the beginning of the pandemic, I have picked up new habits to keep my family and myself healthy. Before the pandemic hit and I was working at my old job, I found that I was really tired after work. Now that I'm not working, I have a lot more time. However, now I have a lot more work around the house, along with all of my classes. I realized that your energy throughout the day is heavily related to the food you eat. This is why I have started to eat a filling breakfast much more often. Whether it be eggs with avocado toast, cereal or a breakfast sandwich, I try to eat something that will keep me going through my seemingly much longer day. Not only does this keep me energized, but it also much more nutrition compared to my previous routine of only drinking coffee in the morning. Additionally, I've also started making my own juice. I bought a juicer and I have started making carrot juice, apple juice, orange juice and other combinations. Making my own juice is much healthier than drinking store-bought ones, considering how much sugar is in the store-bought ones. On top of this, playing in part with the pandemic, I have made it a habit to remind my children and the other family members to wear their masks so they do not get sick, keeping all of us healthy. I also remind my children to wash their hands often throughout the school day. As soon as they get home from school and every time they eat to reduce the risk of getting sick. I also make sure to clean my house more often to keep us safe and healthy. This is pretty much what I'm doing to keep my family and myself healthy during the heartless time. I hope you enjoyed this week's podcast and I hope to see you next week. Bye-bye. And now let's take a look at the tech. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this brief tutorial on how to use Anchor FM to record your podcast. So first you go to the App Store in order to get the free app. And I already have it here, so let's take a look. This is the front uh, page showing my different episodes here. But let's go ahead and go to Tools because this is where all the magic happens. So when I hit Tools, we can see a variety of the different features for this app. So we have Voice Messages, which is where your listeners can uh, record any responses to your content. And then we have Music from Spotify, which you can use to jazz up your podcast episodes and then we have record which is where all the magic happens and here you can invite friends to join I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do that so that students can collaborate um, by recording together from a distance which is the whole purpose of this yes so when I do this uh, the audio will go out for a moment but I would like to show you how it works
Okay, so as you could see there, there were a variety of ways that you could invite somebody to participate in your recording. And the other person doesn't necessarily have to have Anchor in order to participate. They can just click on the link and they are automatically invited to record. Now let's take a look at the library. Very important because it's where all of the audio that you record is stored. And the magic here is these three little buttons where you can trim and uh, start an endpoint. You can edit your audio. You can splice it up, things like that. You can add background music, rename the segment, all of those things. So to just briefly take a look at the trim audio option, you could say, oh, let's start this here. Let's end this here. Okay, so that's just a brief look at that. And then if you don't want to use Spotify, you can use their cute little interlude uh, music here. Uh, for your background, or you can use some sounds to transition between your segments. Okay, so uh, now let's go ahead and just do a brief sample of a recording. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Yasmin's Grammar Class Podcast. All right, now you want to add some background music to that, let's say. Let's go with some nice little Skyway there, and we save it, and we can name it Test or whatever you'd like, test for now. Uh, you hit add this recording to episode, and I'm gonna say not yet, because I don't really wanna publish this, but if I did wanna publish it, I would hit the publish button there. I can enter the title episode, description, season, episode number, etc. Okay, so I hope that this has given you a nice idea of how to use this app. Hello everyone, and welcome to this brief so remember that the basis for this project was experimental. It was, it was basically research. And so my data collection included a questionnaire with yes, no, Likert scale and open-ended questions. Again, just to try to see what the impact of, um, of having podcasting be the primary tool for instruction uh, would be. Okay, so here is an example of responses to the open-ended question. How do you think you have benefited from recording podcast episodes? So the students said things like, I improved writing and speaking. Now I can listen to myself as I talk and see the mistakes I make. I feel my pronunciation has improved a lot. I know how to record it and maybe one day I will have my own podcast. So this is really my favorite response. And then of course, course, uh, new vocabulary. Now, in terms of vocabulary improvement, most students rated theirs between seven and eight on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the highest. But in future semesters, uh, once I do a little bit more tweaking to this project, I hope to see some tens or at least some more nines. So before we wrap up, I assigned the students a final project. They had to create their very own podcasts, including the name, artwork, subject matter, and episode, and podcast description as well. So here is a sample of one that I think is really nice. Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of this podcast. My name is Alejandra and today we're going to talk about a topic that I consider really important, health and sports. For that, I want to introduce you to a very special guest. From Colombia to the world, John Jairo Salazar, professional in sports science and football soccer athlete. Welcome John and thank you for your time. Hi Ale, thanks for inviting me and I'll be glad to answer all your questions. So I would like to talk about physical activity, exercise, and sports. First of all, is there any difference between those three concepts? Yes, there are a lot of difference among these words. You may have heard that a lot of people use them as a synonymous to each other when they talk about health. And somehow they are right and wrong, but mostly wrong. So the first thing we should have clear is the concept of physical activity, because it is wider. Physical activity is basically any movement that is more demanding than being in bed. Getting out of bed is physical activity. 
what you are saying is that walking, opening the fridge, petting my dog, or even grabbing my phone is physical activity? Exactly. We don't realize the cost of energy because a lot of those actions are so simple for us, but for our body and ourselves is a huge process that means converting what we eat into potential energy for movement. Got it. How about exercise? That is for sure something that requires energy. Yes, exercise is physical activity but with two big characteristics, intensity and intention. Look, keep in mind that the world's biggest killers are heart diseases, a lot of them because of sedentary lifestyle or unbalanced nutrition. So when you dosify the physical activity, let's say for example three times a week swimming 30 minutes, you have intensity. And when you do it because you want to reduce your probability of getting ill or to improve your life's quality, you are having intention to. With those two things, intention and intensity, you're do dosing physical activity. Therefore, you're doing exercise. Just with that? I'll add a third one, which is the expert. This person will take your medical conditions, the, the goals you want to achieve, the physical activities you like, and will guide you with safely through all this process. Young people are usually seeking for a six pack or a big butt, but there's a lot of people that just want to live better, like the ones with high blood pressure, arthritis, obesity, diabetes. It's really important to go through this process hand by hand with an expert so you reduce the risk, achieve your goals faster, and have fun in the process. Let me give you an example and ask you something. I work five times a week in an office at the top of the building. If I use the, the stairs instead of the elevator once per day, five times a week, with the clear intention of having stronger legs and reducing some fat, am I doing exercise? Absolutely. I will just recommend you to have an expert, analyze your conditions, your technique, check your nutrition and suggest more activities to achieve your goals so you don't quit because let's be realistic. There are so many more fun ways to reduce fat than walking in the stairs. <laughs> Understood. How about practicing sports? Well, practicing sports is still physical activity with two extra ingredients, competition and referees to make sure we don't kill each other. <laughs> so athletes follow certain exercise depending on their sport and every once in a while they, they go to competition. Mm, will sport improve people's quality of life? Well, that's a tricky question. Okay, everyone. So um, thank you so much for attending my presentation today. I'm going to stop my share now. <laughs> All right, Yasmin, I am super excited about the content of your presentation. Um, it's just simply amazing. I, I love technology, so I'm very intrigued. And um, I just want to understand, and maybe I missed it myself, are your students all in one location or are they in separate locations? Uh, okay, so this was remote. I mean, this was all done remotely. Um, so yeah, they're definitely, they were in different locations in New York uh, at the time. Uh, this particular class, um, we may have had one or two students that were out of the country as well that were, uh, that were taking the class. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We do have a few more questions um, that I've seen in the chat. But I want to be sure to give uh, time to Saharu Musa in Kasum Dio. So good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, depending on where you are. So as you can see it on the schedule program, my name is Hasum Job from Senegal. I'm an EFL teacher and other trainer. Um, today I'm very honored and privileged to have given the opportunity to bring my contribution. Um, in this Belpaf uh, uh, International Symposium. Um, yeah, well, I, I'm not that so familiar with virtual international conference. It is my second time. The first one was, was uh, the first one was with Nail Thistle. And now we have the Belpaf opportunity for me to exchange with people around the world. Well, and my presentation then is addressed or is targeted to teachers who are now actually uh, being 
uh, in classes um, with the current context. Um, so, um, as you can see, this is just um, an idea of the objectives of my presentations. Well, as I said, it is not um, um, meant for experts you are, but um, for teachers who are actually in classes in this pandemic context. I wanted just to show them how we can um, use social media and teaching in this particular context. I'll come back to the context. But here, just roughly, my objective in the first one, you know, it would be an occasion for them to discuss the use of social media. As Dr. Ocon pointed out a while back, people uh, had a different conception of the use of social media. Uh, most of the time, we think that social media is bad and it's, uh, it's kind of a negative uh, repetition. And, but we teachers, we uh, have a different point of view, a different background. That's what I would like my teachers discuss in that session. And the second point is relating to teaching and learning. It's about the stages of how to go through a um, uh, reading comprehension lesson or just a productive lesson uh, using WhatsApp. And the next step would be how to design a lesson plan because we need a lesson plan, even if it is virtually, um, we, we need a lesson plan to very um, uh, precisely uh, conduct our, our lessons. So these were actually the objectives I, 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 I meant at when addressing this issue of social media and ELT. Now let's come to the context. Um, well, in our Senegalese context, we are familiar with using tech tools in education because even though it is a low resource context, we oftentimes resort to um, technologies like computers, like radio, like TV, like even phone to, to do some classes and with some challenges as well. But as Dr. Ocon said it, we are just soldiering on regardless of those obstacles and areas. But to put it in a nutshell, we are familiar with using tech tools in our teaching environment. Next to that was a, is the development of social apps. At a certain moment, you know, there's a very big spread of social application in the environment of our students to the point that our students are a real expert of uh, social apps. They know better than the teachers do. Yes, our students in our context in Senegal, they know much more better than the teachers do regarding to the use of social applications. They have it. They have Instagram, they have Facebook, they have WhatsApp, they have TikTok. They have all those kind of things I even don't know. Just to put it in the environment about how we use technology and how uh, we are, you know, uh, surrounded by social application. And it goes without saying that there might be a, 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 a connection between these tech tools and social application in the context of, of teaching and learning. Uh, when then COVID-19 broke out and the Senegalese uh, government took some decision to, um, to close schools, there was a pressing need to continue the teaching and learning process. But how? Uh, the ministry uh, provided some uh, uh, sessions on televisions, sometimes, you know, some lessons on UTIP. Sometimes also we ask teachers to go to the radio stations to uh, provide lessons to, to some um, students. But as we said in the first session with Dr. Ocon, there are some areas where, you know, internet accessibility is a problem, electricity is a problem. So those teachers and students could not benefit from the, the wide range of opportunities uh, the, 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 the ministry was given during this specific time of pandemic COVID-19 with the homeschooling, as they said it, upon our local. And, 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 and you know, teachers said, well, how could we do in order to be very close to those students who are in remote areas, in remote villages, 
yet they need it, you know, to, to, to continue the, the teaching and the learning. And there comes, you know, the idea to resort to the, the cheapest, you know, social app, the one the students use a lot and the one they master a lot. And the idea came, came to our mind to try having a class using WhatsApp. And it was, well, the very first experience with distant learning because we are very, we were, we were, we were accustomed with, you know, our face-to-face -face learning, but with the pandemic situation and the government, you know, um, decisions, you know, there was always a, a solution and the solution that came to our mind, considering the environment with tech tools and social application was just, you know, distance learning or virtual learning. But this one, um, this presentation focuses on how to use WhatsApp in particular. I'm not talking about high tech tools, but just low tech tools referring to those students who are in uh, remote areas. Now, the next step is, um, well, how then uh, to, to go through the, the different stages in order to, to, to run a, a class on, on or a session on, on WhatsApp. Well, um, the other said is here, the first step should be to create a WhatsApp class. You know, since uh, most of the students, they got the smartphone, they got, you know, phone number and they can buy data. It's not that so much expensive. It is accessible to all students or almost all students. And the idea was first to have a virtual class. Yes, to have a virtual class. And when the class is set, now it is always good to discuss, to arrange a suitable date and time for the session. Um, um, uh, because uh, it, it is worth pointing out that uh, in our schools, it's not uh, official, you know, to use smartphone for the teaching and learning. It's not official because the school regulation uh, 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 haven't yet, you know, uh, uh, allowed uh, teachers and students resort to these uh, devices uh, to teach. But as I said, due to other context, you know, um, we, we relied on, you know, teachers' creativity and as well uh, material accessibility in order to continue the teaching and learning. So when we found out that almost all the students have smartphone and they can buy data, we said, now let's try to virtually meet on WhatsApp and try to, to have the lesson. When, you know, uh, conducting a lesson online is not that so easy uh, without rules and regulation. And, that's why we think it's always important and necessary to, to negotiate with your students in order to have to come up with a, a rule, some rules to accept and to abide by when the lesson is being processed. And it's also necessary to, to design a lesson plan uh, as you were doing um, a, 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 a face to face lesson. So it needs to have a good and clear and well-conducted lesson plan. Now, something, uh, diff um, how can I say, uh, particularly different is when you have finished with designing your lesson plan, you need to transform it into activities and uh, into pictures. I mean, in pictures, you put the lesson plan in pictures. I will show you some, um, some, some activities in the lesson plan that I put into pictures to be used later on with my computer. The last thing that is worth um, being mentioned is it is more convenient to teach with WhatsApp using your computer. Even though you can do it with your phone, but computer is the most convenient uh, device that you can use teaching uh, uh, productive skills, whether it is listening comprehension or reading comprehension using WhatsApp. Um, next slide is now once the group is set, once you have your rules and regulation, once you have a particular date and time, and once you have finished with your lesson plan and got a computer, now you can uh, get ready for your session. For example, if the session is uh, scheduled on uh, Sunday, it's always good in the WhatsApp group to send reminders for the students to get ready, to get connected 
during the day of the session. And also, before starting the lesson, it is good to remind the students that they can use vocal messages or even written messages. Another aspect is that even in WhatsApp, we can have the students work in different groups, in subgroups, as I said it, because uh, it is uh, the idea of having a uh, group working and having to do some works in pairs, et cetera. So uh, while setting up the WhatsApp group, uh, the teachers also need to have some subgroup set up in the WhatsApp so that the students can work in groups before they come back to the bigger group, which is the virtual class. Now, it's time for the session to start. Now, it's good, for example, like to call the role to ask the students to show their virtual hand so that the teacher can know who is here and who is not here. And it is always advisable to repeat this, you know, practice whenever necessary to make sure that students are not only online, but not, you know, present following the session. For example, you can do it every 15 minutes or every 20 minutes or every 25 minutes just to check when the students are still around and, and following the session. So these are the prerequisites, these are the steps you need to do before the session itself starts. Now, here is my lesson plan. I have already designed and have them on pictures, on different pictures, like in different slides. So I have the task one, which is the lead in. I have also one task about the vocabulary, task about gap filling, find a title for the text, information transfer and proof for statement. Uh, these are the while reading activities. I also have a task on the post reading activities, but unfortunately I won't have time to go up to that stage of the, of the lesson. But just bear in mind that we have um, like uh, the, the, the pre-reading activities, the while reading activities and the post reading activities as well can be done still in uh, on, using, on using WhatsApp. So this, this uh, lesson plan needs to be done before you have your session uh, uh, to be run. So I have my date, I have my virtual class, I have the date and time, I have my regulation, I have my lesson plan. Now I am ready for, for the session. So um, well, these, these are the different slides for the lesson plans. So these are the activities. This, I, this one I use in the leading. It is a kind of you know word game that I use in the leading. And this is the vocabulary teaching. You know, I choose some vocabulary and try to teach it as I was like in a face-to-face -face class. So this is still in the vocabulary teaching. So here is the task about you know finding a title. This is the 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 the, the um, information transfer activities. You can see that you know it is in the picture. I got it in the picture so that I can share in the WhatsApp platform for students to see exactly what I ask them to do based on the picture. You know, it cannot be something I re I write on the other message, but it is a picture. All the activities, all the tasks are designed on picture that I will later on send and ask students to follow the instruction and perform the task. So th this is the true or false activity. You can see it is on the picture as well. Now let's have a kind of demo lesson. I just wanna show you how I proceeded while you know delivering the session. After I met all the condition I set while back and having my lesson plan on different pictures, now, this is how I proceeded. You know, now it's time for me to start my classes. It's, for example, um, 10.30. I say to my students, show your virtual hand to start. So this is like I was calling the role to know exactly who is around and who isn't around. So the students start sh uh, showing their virtual hands. So when I count and all my students are around ready for the session, now I can start delivering my class. For example, here in the linen. So as I said, um, I, I, I opened the WhatsApp group. There, I send the picture, okay? So as you can see in WhatsApp, when you use your computer and you insert one picture, you have got a space where you can write the instruction. So I send the picture, but before sending the picture, I take time to write the instruction. So I say, for example, um, uh, Alone, 
the student will work alone, write the first word you can see. But this activity is done in their group, in their group, for example. They will work alone first and they share in their different group before they come to the bigger group. It's like a think and pair share activity. I ask them first alone to write the word they see. And that word is written in the subgroup I created in WhatsApp. And after they discuss, they report in the bigger, in the bigger group. And after writing all the work they can see, the next question was to conceptualize what all those words refer to. For example, you can see social, facial mask, pandemic, infectious, et cetera, et cetera. And after that, with these uh, word items they found, they will conceptualize and they will come up with what I was looking for is about COVID-19. And in the second task in the subgroup still, I will ask them to write, for example, measures to prevent from COVID-19 starting with, I should, for example, I should. Now here are the answers I got. For example, the students say infectious, uh, sanitizer, break, pandemic, mask, etc. And all this was done in the subgroup before I asked them to report in the bigger group. The second task was about some uh, barrier gestures. And here, as you can see, some answers provided by some students. We should stay home, we should wear our face mask, we should not shake hands, et cetera, et cetera. So they share, they, they, they think, they pair, and they share still with using WhatsApp in their different subgroup and in the bigger group as well. You can see here in the, you know, they are working in the group, group one, group two, group three. So I can create as many groups as possible depending on the size of my class. Yes, sometimes the students, the number of students can go up to 50 or 60 students. So I have to create as many groups as necessary to have them work in the best condition and for all of them to participate. So one student was writing his, his or her answer in the group one first, before they report in the bigger in the bigger group. Now, next I will come to the context. So after the lead-in, I will take, I will put a vocal message or I can write. I say to my students, now I'm going to give you a text, you read, and then you will answer to my questions. But before that, I can just ask them to guess what would be the text be about. Given that you know they they they, they perform the task about the leading and so on and so forth. So um, before giving them the test, I pick up some vocabulary items I want them to know before uh, reading the text properly. So here are the words I chose: teenagers, lockdown, outbreak, anxious. And bear, re remember, the students' level was like uh, um, fifth grade high school. First year high school. Don't, these are students of first year high school. And I just pick up these words, teenagers, lockdown, I break anxious, and then to teach them about this uh, before they read the text. So how, how I proceeded was just I first uh, uh, read the, the, I first pronounced the words like teenagers, lockdown, outbreak, anxious, and then I read the definition for each word before I send this picture for them to see and read actually the definition I propose. After that, I have a kind of exercise with that words I use. I send them a kind of gap filling, use the words from the list to complete this passage. So I send the picture first and I have time to write the instruction and I can give them like five minutes, uh, three minutes, seven minutes, depending on the level of the class and the complexity of the, of the exercise. Then the students work in pair sometimes. They share in the subgroup before they report. So here was the answer of group one. They propose the answers in their group. We discuss and I give feedback. And then they find a reporter to report it in the bigger group of the WhatsApp class, the whole group. Now, this is, this is the text. Now I write the text on word format. Then I put it on a picture and as well, I sent on the WhatsApp class and I asked them to take 10 minutes to read. 
silently of the, the text and try to answer to the question. It depends on the length of the text. It can be five minutes or 10 minutes, it depends. But not, 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 not 10 minutes, like five minutes, but like five minutes maximum for, for the students to read the text and try to answer the questions. So then I come to the, you know, uh, while reading activities, uh, following the same procedure as well, um, I send the picture first of the activity and give instructions. The students can work in pair or they work in group before they, they report to the bigger group. So here I say, in your groups, guess which could be the main idea for the tax? So the students were working and discussing in their groups and then they propose answers and then they report in the, in the bigger group. So uh, we can give a lot of time, like five minutes or uh, three minutes, uh, it depends on. Excuse so, me, and, yes. Kasum, yeah. Je veux prie. Sorry. Uh, quelques minutes. Quelques minutes. Okay. So, uh, so very roughly, uh, this is the, the 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 procedures I followed. But let me just jump on the uh, like the the end of the sessions, which were about um, the the compare and contrast about the face-to-face uh, -face lesson and the virtual uh, virtual on using WhatsApp. So you can see uh, there are some similarities with the uh, face-to-face and virtual um, um, lessons using uh, reading comprehension. And you can see we use traditional materials. There are stages and procedures. We still can work and group. And it is like they use some productive skills. In the, in the, in the differences as well, you know, we need to set clear and rules and routines. We also use some emoji for feedback and we can design posts for question, different posts for question. And we have also the possibility to extend time whenever necessary because, you know, uh, working online is a little bit tricky and sometimes, you know, we need to give more time. So, um, uh, yes, this is to come to the end uh, as my time has run out. So um, once again, thank you very much for following and I'm very uh, happy to have contributed and eager to listen to any of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kasam. I really appreciate your presentation and being uh, willing to jump in uh, and to keep us moving. Okay, my topic is uh, technology integration in the African language classrooms. So when I talk about African language classroom, it's about the, the classroom where we have uh, uh, English, uh, where students, uh, where we specialize students. Okay, we prepare them to get into university and become interpreters or uh, translators. So I'm talking about those specific classrooms. Okay, my name, okay, you know, my name is Musa Sardou and uh, about me, okay, I am British uh, Council certified teacher, teacher trainer in the field of law. I also participated in some international training such as English Connect teacher training program in 2021. 2021 using educational technology in the English language classroom from Iowa State University in 2021. This is an on online learning and uh, I also participated in the SUSE program. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, okay, what do we teach as teachers of English? Okay, we teach vocabulary, we teach grammar, we teach reading, we teach writing, we teach speaking, and we teach listening. Okay, next slide. Okay, what are the challenges that uh, we are facing as teachers of English? Okay, the first one is multilingualism contest okay everybody knows that in africa here we have many languages in mali here for example uh, we have uh, 13 official languages okay but beside those languages you have other languages like french okay french is our official language we speak french because we were colonized by france okay so when you have multi multilingualism uh, context it's not easy to learn a language. Above all, when our languages are totally different from 
the Proto-Indo-European languages. For example, the 13 languages we have here in Mali are um, Nilo-Saharan languages. So those languages are totally different. There aren't similarity, okay, even if there is similarity, uh, it's not much, okay? Then we say English language different from African local language. Yeah, this is what I'm explaining right now. Our languages are different. For example, when you take French, French from French to English, uh, you have many similarities. So it is it may be easy for somebody who is speaking English to learn French or to learn uh, Spanish because uh, there are some connection. Then we have low material resources. Yeah, we know that in Africa, not in all Africa, but in some parts, people work in very difficult uh, situation. Materials are not always sufficient. Sometimes they don't exist. Less opportunity for English language learners and teachers in some areas. Okay, you see, people are attracted by a language or by something when there are opportunities. For we teachers of English, we don't have a lot of opportunities. What do I call opportunities is that if there was a kind of connection with the native language speakers, uh, a speaker in America, in uh, Britain, in uh, Australia, in other countries. Okay, if we could build a good relation that could make uh, the teachers of English or the student of English to travel, to go into those countries, discover the culture, discover everything there, it would encourage teachers, okay, and students to learn English. La qualified technology teacher. Yeah, technology is new for, for us here, okay? Not many teachers can use uh, technology and not many students. Uh, yeah, the students are using some technology, but uh, most of the time it's not educational technology. Then the, one of the problems that we are facing is COVID. Okay, we are obliged to close our schools. And when we close our school, if we don't go to technology, our students will stay there and not learn anything. The next, the next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, technology has a solution. Yeah, we have a lot of problems, we have challenges. Uh, for me, I think that technology can be used as a solution to overcome the challenges we are facing when teaching English. Next slide. Yeah, okay, vocabulary and technology. How can you teach vocabulary using technology? Okay, I'm providing you some tools, okay? There are many, but I'm just giving you some. One of the tools is Voice of America. Voice of America is a, a tool that offers both learners and teachers a wide okay, information, wide information, information about the world, information about our country, okay, some news stories that we can use in our, our classroom. So you also have Uglish. Okay, the Uglish is used is uh, very important for pronunciation, okay? Uh, pronunciation is a problem in Africa because our languages, as I said earlier, are totally different from uh, from uh, the Proto-Indo-European languages. So when you use English, English allows the learners and the students, okay, the students and teachers to know how the word is pronounced. Next slide. Okay, so how to explore the voice of America? Okay, here on your left, you can see, yeah, if you go to the site on your left, you will have that picture, okay? So you have Space Tourism Company brings excitement to small American town. This is the news, it's, it's about the news story, okay? So when teacher goes, uh, explore uh, um, Voice of America, it depends on you. You just have to, to select the information that are interesting for the context where you are teaching. If you select something that is not interesting for your learners, they will not get interested. So you just have to see what is, okay, what goes with your, the area where you live or what is into your syllabus because we also have a syllabus. Then on your, on my, my rights, okay, you go to, yeah, you have the, mm -hmm. you go to news, news, news world, okay, whenever I want to teach, use uh, Voice of America to teach new words, you go to news word section, okay, next slide, you will see, 
Okay. Yeah, here the word here that we want. Yeah, I like this word, stable, stable, stable. I like it because we all like stability. It's a positive word. Okay, so on your on my left, okay. So you see here, I would like to know something more about the stable. So you yeah, you can see the section, the news word. Yeah, the news word section. This is the section that is devoted for learning vocabulary. So when you go there. You see here, you have different words. You have mercenaries. For example, I don't like this word, so I won't take it. I see uh, stable, so I want to study stable with my student. So on my my right, you see, you can see the video here. You you have a video here where uh, someone is talking about the news, is giving news and the. Uh, when giving news, he's using stubble, stubble, okay? So by using the word stubble, the student will be able to understand the meaning of stubble, okay? And uh, you have the transcription down. Is, this is good for listening, okay? So you have the, 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 the someone is speaking and you have the transcription down. Okay, we, yeah, so next move, next slide. Okay, now it's grammar and technology. Yeah, grammar is very difficult for our students. And anyone, anytime you want to teach grammar, you see students, some students are not happy because uh, grammar calls for rules. Okay, but uh, no worry. You can, we can use technology to, to teach grammar in uh, a very simple way. So COCA, so many of you know what I'm talking about, okay? This is just uh, uh, a space for sharing, okay? So we have Coca Corpus of Contemporary American English that is really very rich, which uh, has got many functions like collocate, chart, compare, list, uh, keyword in context. So Coca will allow you; it will allow you to to see the word used in many many different words. Okay. Uh, the words used in many, many different sentences and different contexts, okay? So uh, yeah, let's see together how we can use the word stable in a sentence using coca. Next move, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, okay, so you have coca here on my, yeah, here I'm exploring list. So I, as I said earlier, there are many functions. You have charts. Okay, you have others, collocates. Then here I am exploring list. Okay, so we you you have the bar here. You 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 write the word stubble. When you write the word stubble, you can see on the right here that the word stubble is used in many different uh, sentences. If you, if you can zoom it for us, the right part. If you can zoom it for us, please. Uh, okay, it's not possible. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's move to the next one. Next slide. Okay. Now, now it's reading and technology. Okay. Uh, for reading and technology too, you can use Voice of America. Okay. Because on Voice of America, you have many texts. You have the, the text that you can use. Okay. You have uh, the speech. And you have the text, okay? And you have American English. Yeah, the resources part that is very rich with reading, some reading activities. Then you have a WebFX readability test tool and a readability analyzer. I like those last two uh, tools. I like them very much because they will sometimes when you select a text, you don't know if the text is difficult or not for the student. Because if the text is difficult, the student will not be interested in the learning. Anytime the learning is difficult, the student will not be interested in it. And you know what uh, um, the tos Bloom tos taxonomy is asking us to, to follow, okay? We go from simpler to more to, to, to uh, most difficult. So with the two tools, you can measure the text and know if the text is difficult or not. You can calculate the difficulty, whether it is difficult or not. So we go to the next slide and we will see, because I try to explore. Yeah, okay. So we, we are just going to work with one, okay? The web FX readability test tool. 
Okay, as you can see here, okay, mm -hmm. on my the the left, okay, I want to view view a Voice of America, and uh, I went to look for an information that happened in Mali. Okay, you know that in Mali, there are months ago a woman gave birth to nine nine babies. So I want to see if the information information is there in VOA. Then I found that yes, the information is there. This will be interesting for my students because they know something about the story and it's, it's not new for them. They'll be very glad, happy to learn about it. So I select this text there and the went to, okay, on my right, you have the readability text that's there. I calculated to see if this text is good for my students. Okay, and the result is in the next slide. The next slide. Okay, then you can see the result here. Okay. Uh, it is telling me that this is a text for seven grade students. Okay, the seven grade students, and it is even giving me the age. I can't see it well. I don't know if it is uh, 11, from 11 to 13 years old. Okay, and on my, my, my right, you have some more information about the difficulty number of words. Okay, 256. You, you can see, okay. Uh, number of sentences, uh, number of difficult words. So you have some information about uh, the text. So it is up to you to decide whether this text is suitable for my learners or not. If it is not suitable, please let it. If it is suitable, please continue. Okay, some people will say that this is a standard measurement. Yes, it's a standard measurement, but it is up to the teacher to adapt it. Our job is adapting. Whenever you prepare a lesson, we adapt, okay, to see in to our context because contexts are different. Next slide, please. Okay, so here you have all the all the tools. We don't have uh, much time. We cannot explore all of them. This is why, okay, I gave you some here. You have some here. Grammarly.com. Grammarly.com is a spell checker, okay, for the teacher. When you write. Uh, if you write something that you want to use with your students, you go to Grammarly.com. It will help you to correct the words, okay, even the sentences, okay? It will underline and turn, give you some proposition, okay? And it is up to you to change. Then if you have breaking news, English.com. I really love this one because this one is really rich with a variety of texts. Not only text, but questions. You have reading comprehension question, multiple choice question, true or false question, uh, vocabulary much. You have listening. Oh, you have many, lot of things that you can do, okay? With this, uh, uh, the breakingnewsenglish.com. Very interesting one. It is also like a, a VOA, but I think personally think that it is richer, richer than uh, VOA. Your Quizlets, okay, Google Suite for Education, Google Maps, Google Earth, Uglish. Okay, we saw Uglish earlier. We said that is uh, important for our pronunciation. Uh, then we continue to the next slide. I want to be in the time. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. This is uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, I had problem with the connection today. You see, technology is not anybody's friend. <laughs> okay, see you. Okay. Thank you. If there okay, you have any I'm questions. so good. Thank you. I'm glad, um, Sahadu, that you were able um, to make your presentation. We really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. I am looking really quickly. I have not seen. Um, a lot of questions. I do see one from, is it Tessa Lane Mokone? Um, I don't know who it, the, the question is directed to. Tessa Lane, can you explain and ask your question? Yes, Tessa Lane, go yeah. ahead. You have your hand raised. Yeah. Okay, unmute. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Hello. Hello, yes. can you hear me? 
Yes. Yeah, we can hear you very well. All right, thank you. Uh, you're talking to Zelani Mukoni from uh, South Africa, Pretoria. So my question was that uh, when you teach uh, learners reading using uh, WhatsApp, what is that for? In uh, you are going to use that method for which grade? And then what are you going to do with those who can't read? Thank you. Oh, this is not a question for me. Maybe it's the question for the previous one. The yes, for the previous presenter. presenter, yes. Yeah. Even though there is a link between uh, our topic. Yes, um, that is for uh, Kasam Dia. Kasam, can you answer or address the, the question? Kasum for yes, for Kasum. Is he still with us? Okay, maybe not. Um, He's not with us. Okay, uh, Tess Lane, I put his email in the chat. So okay, if you would please um, email him directly so that he can give you some feedback. All right, thank you. You're welcome. I saw another question. This is from Terry, hold on one second. From Terry R, if you would like to ask your question in, um, please address the, the speaker's name so they know. Oh, no, okay, I see what that is now. I'll address it later. Okay, so Andre, just going through really quickly. This is from um, Masum Bila. Masum, did you have a question for one of our speakers about homeschooling? So, okay, Masum is not there. I'll keep going. Yasmin, are you still with us? Yasmin, she had a question about, um, Oh, about WhatsApp. Okay, we're good with that. And Colleen asked, do the students take pictures of the work they have done and send it back to you? Colleen, who is that question directed to? No, okay. That's fine. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over. I'm just checking really quick to make sure that we don't have any other questions. Um, okay, if there is no question, uh, can I add something? Yes, one minute, please. Yeah, okay. I would like to say that those uh, tools are, are useful for both face-to-face -face classroom and online learning because when you give you give the, the tools to the students, the student will be independent and at home they can work a lot. They can work and become independent learners. Yeah, this is what I would like to add. This is very important. When students have the tools themselves, yeah, true is that not all the students have got smartphone, but in a family there is a smartphone. The father's smartphone or the mother's smartphone. And everybody knows that in Africa, we live in community. Something belongs to everybody, okay? So the learners or the students can use the father's phone, okay, to, to learn. Thank you. Okay. We have few people going off, uh, going away. Thank you because they are, it's getting late where they are. <laughs> All right, I don't see any additional questions in the chat and I don't see any hands raised. So I just wanna say thank you very much to our three presenters for uh, the topic on oh, pedagogies and technology. Kasi um, is back again. Oh, Kasum? Yeah, I'm back again. I'm sorry I left because I had another session to follow. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, but yes, there, there was a question for you, but I'll send it to, oh, Tessa Lane. It's Tessa Lane that had her question. Can you ask it, Mary? Hello, 
Hello, ma'am. Hello, it's Zelani Tessalane again. Yes, please ask your question to Mr. Kasum. Okay. He's back. Okay, Kasum, thank you now that you are back. Uh, my question was, uh, that method of using uh, WhatsApp for teaching reading, in which grade are you going to use it? And what about those learners who don't know how to read? How are you going to assist them? Thank you. Um, thank you, Tessalena, for your questions and for your interest in the topic. Well, as I said it, um, that, that lesson was for high school students, like in fifth grade, fourth, um, uh, lower six and upper six. Um, well, actually, it means that those students, you know, know well uh, about how to read and understand the text. But even if it is for lower levels, like beginners as well, we can just follow the same procedure, but um, selecting a text that fits to their level and 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 and, and ability. Uh, for example, we can we can we, when we have, for example, a fifth grade student like students in junior school, uh, the one who uh, learn English for first year or second year, we can even adapt the text. It's just a matter of text adaptability. You, t you choose a text that fits to their to their understanding, and you 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 you, you design activities that fit to their to their level, and just you know uh, avoid uh, um, very complex text and very complex question as well, because just uh, following online is already a challenge. So if you want them again to face another challenge of text accessibility, it might be a, 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 a real a problem. So I think you can use it to any level, but you just need to be very cautious in the text selection. The text should fit to the level of your students. Okay, thank you, uh, Katu. It's a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Okay, I'm turning it over to uh, Miss Mary Romney. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to all of the presenters um, who we've had the privilege of listening to this morning. Um, we're slightly behind schedule, but we would like to give you a break. We wanted it to be longer than this, but again, since we are behind schedule, we're just going to, to reduce the break to five minutes. Um, and uh, after that, we'll um, start our EFL colloquium. Um, which uh, has a lot of moving parts. <laughs> so um, we'll see you in about five minutes. Uh, and, and thank you so much for your attention, collaboration, and participation.